Without further ado, we'll kick off. Welcome everyone to the Schuylkill Township Board of Supervisors meeting for Wednesday, September 13th, 2023. We'll start tonight's meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, for roll call, we have present tonight uh, in person Bob Cooney, Martha Majeski, Mark Donovan, and Susan Gret. And virtually online, we have Danielle Juen. Uh, <clears throat> we did have an executive session before tonight's meeting, also on August 23rd and August 24th, to discuss potential property acquisition, personnel, and litigation matters. Okay, uh, acceptance of the minutes of the Board of Supervisors for August 9, 2023 business meeting. All departmental, committee, commission, and council reports as posted and received by the Board of Supervisors for the month, August 2023. I'll make that motion. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Any discussion? Any comments from the public? All in favor say aye. 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 <clears throat> Uh, treasurer's report and payment of bills. Lori. <laughs> right under the wire with our payment of bills, but <laughs> um, for this month we have a general fund balance of just over 5.3 million. It's up just slightly over last month, about where we, where we would expect to be at this time of year. All the bills have been reviewed and are recommended for payment. And we got those checks to print about 10 minutes ago, thanks to the amazing staff here who figured out our technical woes. So, good to go. <laughs> All right, I'll make a motion. We pay those bills. Second. I'll second. Any discussion, comments? All in favor? Aye. My bad. Consideration of acceptance of treasurer's report for period ending August 31, 2023. I will make that motion. I'll second. All right. Discussion, comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So I did, the, did them backwards. Sorry about that. Normally at this time we'd go into a discussion regarding some subdivision and land development, but we've got a man in the audience, a lieutenant, Phil Fitzsimmons, who just came off a, of a two-week crazy schedule on a manhunt. And um, we'd normally have that report closer to the end of the meeting, but knowing that you haven't had much sleep and we'd like to get you some rest, I figured we'd ask you to uh, give your, your report now, if you don't mind. Thanks. Normally, I give you monthly statistics at these meetings, and I, I think I'll dispense with that tonight. I want to start by thanking the chairman and the rest of the board for allowing me to serve along with Officer Mignona and Officer Chalice on our regional SWAT team and for supporting us while we do that with the training that we do. I can't tell you how humbled I am to have worked alongside them these last two weeks, sometimes 30-hour days. We've, we've lived out of cars and, and uh, trucks, but especially because we had skin in the game. This was our homicide, and he got away from the county prison, and we took it personal. Today, I also had the privilege, because we were short, of actually being in the woods online with the guys. When we pushed up over the ridge, which is about a mile and a half from my house, by the way, and we pushed them right into the other line. We were embedded with the state police today, and we pushed them into the other line of the state police and took them into custody. It was a relief. Um, I wish. I could be present when the girls are told that he's back in jail because I know that they were very upset when they found out that he was out and that was on my mind also. But again, I, I really want to express my heartfelt gratitude to all of you for allowing us to do that. Um, I've done SWAT for 35 years and everything I learned and then some came into play. We worked seamlessly with the state with the FBI, we were with the FBI two days before, with, believe it or not, with the Game Commission, with uh, Border Patrol, Customs, 
Everybody came together. It didn't matter what patch you wore on your shoulder, what you did. Everybody worked together for one goal, which was to put him back in jail. And I thank you all for that. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. And I think I can say from all of us, thank you and, and the team for doing what you did. We're so glad that it's, uh, it's done with and that nobody got hurt, um, law enforcement as well as res residents. So uh, great job. And Bill, I just wanted to say, you know, from going back three weeks ago, um, I just wanted to thank the, the entire department for everything that they did in court to get this guy convicted. I heard that, uh, yes. And uh, today, I was actually going to hook for Marquis Head because she was with us that night that we called him the first time at 2 o'clock in the morning when he had the Virginia State Police pick him up. And it was, I think we both had a huge sense of relief that he was back in custody. So thank you again. All right. Um, board discussion items. We'll start out with subdivision and land development. I think we've got the folks from Polar Builders here to discuss the Sedgley Farms and Select Sites LP. Todd, the floor is yours. Good evening. I'm Todd Polig, president of Polig Builders, uh, equitable owner under an agreement of sale uh, with respect to the 65 plus acre Reeves property. And I'm also the agent for 876 East Phillip Drive, representing Select Sites, owner of that property. I'm here tonight, uh, here tonight from our development team are Wayne Layton from Pollock Homes, Jerry May Jeremy Mazar from Chester Valley Engineers, uh, our project civil engineer, and John Snyder from Saul Ewing, our land use attorney. Uh, the project. Give me one second, Todd. Danielle, can you hear everything okay? I can, thank you. Sorry, I have it on mute. Um, I, my apologies, uh, uh, everyone, for not attending, but I have COVID and you wouldn't want me there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the project is a 51 lot single family development titled Sedgley Farm, encompassing the 65 acres. Um, note the plan is oriented with north to the right. I have a little red arrow on there. So um, as we're discussing that. Uh, it's located in the township's R1 zoning district. It abuts um, R2 zoning on the north and west, uh, East Phillip and Wells Road, and it abuts R1 zoning on the northeast of Dorchester Way. Um, it's adjacent to the Pickering Reservoir. It's access, ac access from Valley Forge Road to the north via a 52 to 50 foot, four foot wide panhandle and the East Phillip Drive to the west. There are three existing residents on the Reeves property, including the William Reeves House, which is eligible for listing on the National Historic Register. There is a carriage building that has been converted into a residence, and there's a four-room tenant house with two rooms on the first floor and two rooms on the second floor. There's also a five-acre out parcel to the southwest that was split off for a Reeves family member a number of years ago and it's accessed by the uh, uh, driveway easement, uh, easement over the Reeves property uh, with joint maintenance responsibility. That was recently sold by Glenn Makala, was the, what we all used to refer to as the Makala property, it's five acres. Uh, the Reeves uh, family have been title owners and owned the property prior to the dam and creation of the reservoir. Um, a trustee received a copy of our September 6th letter and memorandum regarding our, uh, our understanding and position on the various items that have been raised with respect to this 51 lot buy right plan, which was initiated in 2006 and put on hold in 2009 uh, at the request of the township to consider an open space cluster development that did not come to fruition. Thus, we reactivated this buy right plan uh, almost a year ago. Uh, consequently, there are items from the 2009 review uh, by the then township engineer uh, Gilmore and Associates, as well as recent reviews by the current township engineer Paul uh, from uh, T&M Associates. We appreciate this opportunity to discuss our project with you this evening. Hopefully we can clarify uh, questions so 
please ask away and we'll try to answer. So um, I guess I'll start here with just one <coughs> quick question. Um, in your memo that's dated September 9th, I'm sorry, is that right? September 6th, forgive me, September 6th, number 11. Let me get to it here, give me a second. It says applicant has met with Aqua, its council and engineers, and has resolved all Aqua's issues as depicted on the red line plan. Some of the stormwater that has that was planned to go to basin A being diverted to basin B to reduce the flow into the reservoir from the discharge point closest to Aqua's water intake. Um, I'm going to, just going to stop there because your first sentence here says that you have met with Aqua and you've resolved all of Aqua's issues. But then we received a letter from Aqua on September 13th, and I will quote from that if you'll give me just a second. Is that from Aqua or from the It's addressed to the Board of Supervisors and you are copied on it. Okay. This, and I, I can read the whole thing, it's very short. Um, this is regarding the preliminary subdivision and land development plans for Polig Builders LLC, comma, Sedgley Farm. Dear Supervisors, please accept this letter as a follow-up to my letter of May 17th, 2023. Aqua was provided with a copy of the 8723 red line plan sheet after Polig Builders attendance at the Planning Commission on August 14, 2023. Aquas engineers have reviewed the red line plan sheet and it does not resolve the concerns listed in my letter of May 17, 2023. I have notified Mr. John Snyder, Esquire, Council for Polig Builders of this. Aqua is opposed to the plans, including the red line sheet. For these reasons, we respect, respectfully request the recommending bodies and supervisors not approve these plans in the current form. So, yep. there's obviously some yep. disagreement uh, here, uh, and I think I I'm can, hoping you'll be able to clear them up. Yep, I hope I can. First, I received a copy of uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Shearing's letter. So. Uh, uh, to John. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, or, or somewhere. So first, I believe we can take care of Aqua's stated concerns dealing with the impact of our development. We had a meeting at my office and discussed these concerns and how they were to be addressed. I believe both Aqua and our engineer felt comfortable with those solutions. Um, uh, given the letter I just got today, I believe there was a miscommunication about the timing because the solutions involved with the stormwater management calculations and facilities, as well as the items to be addressed by the homeowners association documents, the signage, the type of lawn fertilizers allowed, maintenance and ongoing inspection of the buffer, et cetera. Uh, I understood that they would be addressed as part of the final plan process. So, it's apparent that Mr. Shearing was looking for confirmation in advance of the final plan with preliminary plan. So um, I will contact Aqua and uh, perhaps we can address this in a letter agreement because the solutions will come about as part of the final plan, the calculations uh, on the stormwater and all those kind of issues. So, and in the HOA documents will take care of some of the other things they wanted. So. Um, I'm hoping to get a hold of them and we can, uh, maybe we need a letter agreement. I was planning on doing this at final plan. Obviously, he was looking for something ahead of that. 
Paul, Paul, is this is this something that can be done in the final plan, or should is this something that, according to our saldo, should be done during preliminary plan? Uh, the post construction stormwater management plan is required as part of uh, the preliminary plan application. So. The stormwater management uh, items that are listed in the May 17th letter uh, that are of concern should be addressed at the preliminary uh, plan uh, stage of the process. Yeah, let me let me explain because we received that letter fr uh, from Mr. Shearing about three o'clock this afternoon. We did not receive a copy of the letter from you. We had been calling Aqua asking for a letter confirming that we were that the meeting we had in June resolved all those questions because I was at that meeting, Todd was at that meeting, Jeremy was at that meeting, Mr. Shearing, Mr. Lunning, hold on a second, let me finish, let me finish. Mr. Lunning and uh, the chief engineer for Aqua were all at that meeting. We went through every item in the May letter. We reached a resolution verbally on every item in that May letter. We shook hands and we had an understanding of how it was to be handled. We expected a letter back from them outlining that because we expected the letter to be in Aqua's, on Aqua's letterhead in Aqua's terms instead of us trying to define to them. We've tried to follow up with Mr. Lunning for the last three weeks uh, and have not heard anything from Aqua. We provided Aqua with the red line letter. He didn't get it because of the April or the August 14th meeting. He got it from Jeremy uh, separately earlier. So I don't think Mr. Shearing has the right information. Uh, we've reached out to him. I've sent him two emails today and not heard back from him. But we will get this resolved because we walked out of that June meeting with everybody agreeing what, the, uh, what was to be done and how. Okay, so that's great. So we that's need to great. go. We that's need great. to go back and resolve okay. the miscommunication because there's a miscommunication someplace that's got to be and resolved. I think that's great, but stormwater issues need to be dealt with at preliminary plan, not final plan. No, what we're talking about is having an agreement with Aqua. The stormwater issues of we've we've shown the change in the direction of flow from basin A to basin B on the red line plan. Uh, we've given you that. We've said if your engineer wants to review, we've given you extension for him to review it. The things that are the other type of things are that the homeowners association will have in its document a. Re restriction or a prohibition against using certain chemicals on lawns and things like that. Those are the types of things that don't show up on the red line plant. And what I got today was an email saying, you've sent Aqua a red line plan saying that covers all of our issues. Well, it doesn't cover all the issues. We knew that. It, the, there are certain issues that go uh, in documents and not on a plan. So we'll get this resolved with Aqua. Uh, we all shook hands and had uh, had it all resolved at the June meeting. So uh, we'll go back and resolve it again. Okay. So. So Paul, what? Uh, I'm going to ask Paul a question real quick. Paul, what are the actual? What are the actual requirements for stormwater submission? Like, do you have the? Do you have a notation handy on that? I, I because we haven't received PCSM documents like in total. I know that that's normally a. Nice well, yes, you have. You have. You received them in 2006. Okay. Have we received? And that was the that meant the the requirement for a completed application, just like you received the uh, the planning module in 2006. Are those still accurate? Now, or are those been updated since then? I'm now we sent you on January 6 an updated of the of the narrative because it's the narrative I've that the changes the the plan itself for the post for, for the PCSM actually comes out of what gets approved by the conservation district and DEP uh, as to uh, what that management is we've we've shown our plans have what your requirements are go ahead 
The post-construction storm management plan that was submitted in 2006 is, is outdated. The stormwater management facility A is now an above ground facility, previously was below ground. The plans that have been provided to us that talk about the redirected water, it's only in plan view. So I have no profile design, I have no, no idea what's going on underneath the ground. In the letter, it talks about the water is being diverted. Is, it, is, it, is that structure now a junction structure where some water is going this way, some water is going that way? I don't know. It's not shown on the plans. Additionally, it's crossing over stormwater, the, the, the inlets that are in stormwater area C. I don't know if they've been eliminated. Uh, it looks like there's going to be in conflict. Plus, it looks like the sanitary sewer would be in conflict with the proposed new design of the stormwater management. Additionally, if all the water is being redirected from A to B, we have no idea design-wise if B can handle the peak and post runoff plan, uh, as well as do the loading ratios because Segley Lane from pretty much from Route 23 all the way to the intersection of Sedgley Lane and Eagles Point, a lot of impervious cover is going to be redirected to B. Uh, is stormwater management facility C even needed? Have those inlets been removed? I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of things that have changed over the course of time here that are not reflected on both this red line plan as well as the, uh, the plans uh, that were submitted back in uh, April that we reviewed. So these are significant design changes that the township is unaware of what's going on. Paul, that, you're exactly right. That they will be designed as part of a final plan change. What we tried to show to the uh, township and more or less the planning commission because they were interested in where these lot lines were, we needed additional um, easement between two lots, for instance, to bring stormwater, uh, the rearranged stormwater. That, all those design questions are going to be part of final plan. Aqua asked if we would do that. We're, we're certainly happy to do that. Uh, they're, not, um, they're not part of uh, the requirements as they are right now are shown on our plan and work. However, we're willing to make these changes, they need to be, but they need to be part of the final plan. Question on this is in general, do we know whether um, this, with these aqua issues, whether the plans will have to be changed materially later on because the board's asked to vote on, I guess the April plan is modified by the red line plans. How extensive, if at all, uh, will the changes be after some of these inlets are moved, and if, if, if they're moved, will that affect other things? And, you know, the, the, the board wonders, you know, whether, you know, how can they vote sort of blindfolded, uh, not knowing whether there are going to be significant changes to the plan from preliminary to final. Normally this stuff is wrapped up in preliminary, and the final is, um, you know, just sweeping things up ministerial, and we can't tell at this point um, you know, how serious this stuff is, if at all. We don't know. Right, and, and we'll need to do a lot of homework and, and figures to find out uh, all those changes. Now, the idea is Aqua asked us to do that. We're happy to do that. But, we wanna, but we, when we talked about it, it was going to be done at final plan. So uh, the preliminary uh, stormwater management works as is. It's a question of if we make these changes on final plan, obviously the engineer is going to have to check it. All that stuff's going to need to be checked again. But we're trying to accommodate something that Aqua asked us to do. Well, I, I understand that. But what if Aqua says to you guys, we need you to do this, and you either can't do it or won't do it? What happens then? I think the easy answer to that is is what we're doing compliant with your ordinance? From the township standpoint, that's the question. What's between Aqua and us is between Aqua and us is to them asking us to make changes in us. Right now, we've agreed to everything that they've asked us to do. So, uh, you know, we don't think there'll be a problem with Aqua as you go forward. That's why we were absolutely shocked at the, at the letter today and why somebody didn't pick up the phone or send us an email or say, 
what's going on. Instead, we get a three o'clock letter the day of the meeting uh, and from the lawyer, not from our contacts at Aqua. So uh, that surprised us. Just to be clear, to the extent there's a suggestion that we didn't notify you, we saw a CC on the letter to you and didn't feel we had the need to. Yeah, I understand. And there wasn't a CC to you on the letter to me. So that's why I was asking whether that was a letter addressed to me that somehow it been distributed that way as well wouldn't have bothered me, but I just wondered what the letter was. You want to see it? Uh, I'm sure I have a copy that'll get there tomorrow it's, or something. It's, 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 you. <clears throat> it's It'll be in your email. It. Okay. Well, I, it's not in my emails all the way up until uh, seven o'clock tonight. You were. Uh, <laughs> you were. Co you these. you were copied on the email. The email. I, I don't have it. Yeah. That's why I, didn't, I saw you were on the email from, this morning at 11.20 a.m. From Mike? From an associate in his office. Okay. I, I yeah. don't have that. I'll piggyback on the aqua questions. I guess on page 9, item 25 from your September 6th letter, Regarding the old uh, existing culvert crossing to the southern portion of the tract, uh, that's just upstream from where you intend to build the new crossing uh, of the same creek slash ravine. Uh, I think, Todd, you said that old culvert in flood conditions, I think you used the word overtops or goes underwater. That was a good while back. So I guess my question is, is, is that considered part of your road network in this? plan. I, I see there the uh, the blue represents the roads. I don't see the um, the second crossing listed there. Yeah, there's a second crossing uh, which is the existing uh, crossing today. Excuse me, existing driveway. That was... Yep. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, that is the... Uh, that's utilized today for access. It's a stone road till you get to um, the culvert. That culvert was replaced after Hurricane Ida. Uh, so it's a new, uh, new culvert under there. Uh, you may recall uh, that the previous culvert, um, an engineer had taken a look at that and estimated it only had about a five year life left or something like that. Uh, remember the engineer's report on that. So when we needed to do some work down there, uh, <clears throat> we got the permits and replaced that culvert. Uh, it was a concrete culvert. It's now um, a, uh, uh, the, uh, what is it, a high plastic, what do you call it? High density plastic car. HDP. HDP. Uh, yep. Um, and uh, actually it, uh, it passes about 150% of what uh, the concrete uh, passed before because of the uh, hydraulics of the uh, material. So in any event, it's a brand new culvert um, and, uh, and a new driveway and can certainly act uh, as an emergency access uh, for the future. So if I'm not mistaken, the old culvert uh, and that report said it was a galvanized, corrugated. You went to a plastic and yep. the plastic has 150% more than the, the galvanized? That's correct. Yeah, it was a, uh, you know, the rib galvanized and it, it's actually on the plan. So you don't, you don't show it there, but it is part of your road network that you intend to have incorporated into the development? Yes, it's shown on the plan there. Okay, I just, I just didn't see it's it. It's not blue. The blue, okay. Yeah. Uh, is that also uh, covered by the easement that Aqua gave you permission to use that one and the new easement crossing where the new bridge is? Yeah, underneath the existing uh, driveway that we just talked about, uh, Aqua has two uh, lines underneath there. So they were part of the process when we replaced the culvert. They were there, they inspected it. Uh, they were part of the, uh, we got permission from them and those kinds of things. So there is an easement for those water lines over that driveway. But I mean, for you to use that as part of your road network, you have it's that a driveway. and the other? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it, it, we don't need an easement for it. It's on our property. That one's on our property. The other is an easement. The, the blue road there is in an easement granted by Aqua. Uh, that was, in essence, a trade-off for the, uh, the crossing of that finger. Uh, there was a bridge across there 
many, many years ago and an easement for that bridge. And Aqua didn't want us to rebuild the bridge. Uh, so they gave us the easement for the blue roadway across the stream way back in 2002, three, four, something like that. That was uh, the trade-off. The trade-off wasn't with respect to the driveway culvert. The trade-off was with respect to the old driveway that was a bridge across so the clarify, reservoir. The two high pressure mains that go under the old culvert are, are actually right. traveling across your property, not theirs. That's correct. Okay. It, it's, it's their easement on our property, not e our, our easement from them. Okay. Yeah, when we talked to Aqua, uh, they really asked us if we could relocate our crossing from the from the north side to the south side over on the stream versus the finger of the reservoir uh, because it was a lot more environmentally friendly. I've got another question unless somebody else has one. I have one just to throw in the mix here. I understand there's some issue with the Chester County Chester County Planning Commission that got jammed up in some way. What, what's the status with that? Can you explain that? I believe I just got an email from Lori yesterday that we need to go back in and make sure that there, I guess a payment was missing for the a review of a plan. So I'm going to uh, contact the planning commission and make sure they're up to speed. Is their recommendation a preliminary or a final or what is it? In your I opinion? tell you the truth, Bill, I don't know. I'm going to contact them and whatever they're missing, I'll try to fill in. And as, as Lori said, if, if, if a signature's Required from the township. I'll bring it back to the township. All right. Uh, I have a question for either um, Todd or John. It's about East Phillip Drive, and I don't want to get. We can't do this without getting there. So my, my question is: To what extent? What's your thought about uh, the level of regulation that a township can exercise on a public road? I mean, there are certain things we can do. Uh, do you have any thoughts about how far a township can go in terms of regulation? I, I think it can uh, regulate it any way it's authorized by the state. Uh, I mean, that's such a broad question. I have no idea really what what it is you're, you're in particular so you're asking where, where about. Where you are with regulation of roads, that's all. I, uh, you know, it's a, it's a big topic. And, for example, township owns if the township can set speed limits and can mm -hmm. close it down for festivals and mm -hmm. can do a lot of stuff um how far does that go in as words, far as the state law allows it to go uh, I, you know uh, where <laughs> is that okay. well I, I guess i'd have you'd have to refer me to exactly what issue it is and i would get back to you because well, well let, me, let me just try one just Sure. Let's say somebody got a um, approval for a large condominium development, multi-units for that for this property. Pick a number, 400 units. That comes in. Does the township have any authority in terms of regulation of that under those circumstances, or would you say no? They can connect. It's not. It's not an issue. It's if it's a public street and they have the right to get to it, they have the right to use it. Uh, do you think the township would have a right on that road to limit, say, uh, uh, commercial vehicles? In other words, no, no commercial vehicles. There's, there's probably regulations that deal with that from the state. So I would have to investigate that, but I know that there are roads that say no truck traffic, and I'm sure that that's done consistent with some state regulation of when and how you can do it. Right. In my last example, uh, somebody uh, gets permission for a power plant back there. Could the township say, well, we don't want to, you know, we don't want anything, any entrance for, for, our, for the power plant through East Phillip go through Sedgwick. Could, could, could the township, in your opinion, do that or in not do that? My belief is that if they have a right to get to the road, they have a right to use the road as a public road to the extent that the other types of things that you've asked about, restrictions on the use of the public road are authorized by the state. So 
I don't think the township has the uh, plenary authority to determine something like that. I think the township has whatever authority it has uh, that it gets from the state. All right, thank you. I'm not cross-examining you. Yeah, I want no, to understand but, I mean, what that's, your thoughts are. Okay, yeah. all right, thank you. All right. So on page two, uh, number five, and also page seven, number 15, talks about East Phillip Drive. It says, extension of East Phillip has been engineered consistent with the township saldo. Uh, <clears throat> so extension of East Phillip. Then on page two, number eight, it says uh, the private street. Uh, so it's calling it a private street there, an extension of East Phillip on page two, number five. It says private gated driveway. Uh, which classification does this fall under in our saldo? Okay. Uh, yeah, that's a very easy question. Uh, our subdivision plan shows it as a private street, as a street. It's, it's a street that has an offer of dedication in the plan. The decision as to whether you accept dedication or leave it private is a decision that is totally within the discretion of the board. Uh, so whether that would end up being a public street or a private street is a board decision down the, down the line. You have a, an offer of dedication to it. Now, as we discussed with your planning commission, uh, the uh, Judge Bortner handled this question back in 2018, 20, something like 20, I guess, was his decision. Uh, when it was raised by uh, Glenn Makala as to why the decision on Sedgley Farm didn't turn it down for the reason of the streets internal and uh, East Phillip being secondary, secondary feeders. Judge Bortner, in two pages of decision, said, no, this is not a secondary feeder. And one of the reasons why East Phillip is not a secondary feeder is because it's gated. Now, we have offered you, the board, an ability to control the question of whether East Phillip could be considered as a secondary feeder by offering you a gated alternative an alternative that's up to you to accept or not accept. But as an alternative, the, the plan itself shows it as a street offered for dedication. The offer of, uh, or the request for a waiver uh, on the red line plan that you have uh, of that section of the property shows it as uh, a gated alternative, which would require a waiver. Uh, and those gates would be limited, unlike in Sedgley Farm or uh, uh, Eagles Point, would be limited solely to uh, use by residents, not by residents, guests, not by delivery trucks, but just simply gated to only the decal on the car of the, of the resident itself. So that's, that's an offer that we've made uh, for the board to decide whether they wish to uh, protect East Phillip to that extent, and we're willing to do that as an alternative uh, if the waiver is granted. So you're saying it is classified as a street, not a not a private drive. That's correct on and, our plan. And that Judge Bortner supported that, but wasn't his ruling overturned? No, not with respect to that. His denial of the plan was overturned, but this wasn't a reason for the denial of the plan. That issue was not even appealed to the Commonwealth Court. So Judge Bortner's decision on that was not uh, reversed, overturned, or even reconsidered above. We'll have to talk about that. Any other questions? Any comments? Danielle, do you have anything? No, I do not. Thank you, Bob. One thing. Um, are there any 
general engineering concerns that we should be aware of on the plan at the moment that we would like to see um, updated between now and potential preliminary approval, uh, Paul? That would be ideal to see on, on anything. I mean, right now we've got a red line plan in front of us, which I kind of find a little unusual of working in this field. You know, it's, it's a little unusual, but I understand what you're getting at with it. Um, and, uh, but, but we've also got some other outstanding issues, and I'm just curious, like, what, do, what, should, what should we expect to be uh, voting on in October, I suppose? Uh, because it's very hard to, hard to make a decision on something when it, you, you don't really have the full picture. It's kind of foggy. And uh, preliminary plan, I usually see uh, a nearly complete plan. Uh, yeah. Well, this is, this, this is more than a nearly complete plan. I mean, it's 47 or whatever it is pages. We believe that the revised plan as submitted uh, complies with your ordinances. Understood. We, we've offered a red line plan to show uh, changes that could be made that were brought up by the Planning Commission that we don't believe are compliance issues. Uh, they've asked us to slightly move some lot lines to allow houses to be oriented to a different side of the lot. They've asked us to mm -hmm. uh, move the, uh, to actually put the, uh, the right of way of Sedgley Lane in right. the middle of the, of the uh, 54 foot, uh, whatever it is, panhandle. They've asked us to build the road on the west side of that right of way those are all things that we could do so if i were so if i were to summarize um so yeah what i would say is you have a, a, a plan submission and you have red line plans that either you could condition that we do those on the final plan if you agree with the planning commission that those are better they don't deal with compliance so you'd be comfortable with like the the clean plan submitted, whatever it was. The like the last clean plan submission was your. It would be your intent to say that's your compliant plan, and regardless of the red line plan, you could submit yeah, it under with the, the, the black the, line plan, basically. Yeah, with the uh, the memorandum that explains why we think certain ones of the comments that are in the engineer's letter don't apply. I've, I mean, I've seen those. I'm sure we've we've all seen those. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. So that's where, that's where we are. We think the red line plans are voluntary changes that we're willing to do, and if you want a condition that we do them, that's fine. We think they probably do make the plan better like the Planning Commission thought. Okay, understood. Um, are the, and to my question to Paul, are there any highlights that we should be aware of while we're considering this over the next month or so? Um, well, I, I, as you know, I have a review letter for Reeves Tract uh, that was dated May 17, 2023, and it was amended in June, June 30th, 2023, uh, which in, was the uh, inclusion of all the previous Gilmore Associates review comments. Um, this, uh, this review letter prepared by TNN and Associates was based off of the, uh, the plans that were submitted uh, last revised April 18th, 2023. So the plan set that we have and these red lines, the red lines haven't been reviewed to, to that extent. So uh, some of the different uh, concerns and items that the, the board might want to offer uh, a, a opinion on are, uh, let me just uh, go through this. I, I apologize. There's you know, there's a lot of pages here, so and summary summary is fine. You, it, I don't yeah. need a, I don't need like a rehash of every every single uh, bullet point or anything because we I'm sure we've uh, kicked that to death in the planning commission a bit. But absolutely, well, thanks. <laughs> well, one of, one of the items that uh, that was a concern was the uh, reserve strip that's that runs along uh, essentially Lane on the uh, eastern side, which would go which would uh, abut against five of the existing properties on Dorchester. Um, per the ordinance, uh, reserve strips are not permitted, and the uh, those five lots that are existing 
we have uh, explained that they are going to become double frontage lots. There's going to be Sudley Lane is going to be on one side and Dorchester Way is going to be on the other. So these are existing lots that are going to be turned into double frontage lots because there's going to be a right of way that's going to go right against uh, adjoining the property. Now they're proposing a one foot access reserve strip that's not prohibited, that's not uh, permitted by ordinance. So that is a concern uh, that I've brought up in my letters. And, and our answer to that one is very easy. We believe Judge Nagel handled that when he determined that, for example, the one lot on the west side that has such a strip uh, defining it, he indicated that, or he wrote, that the township has determined that the reserve strip uh, section and the uh, reverse frontage lot section are not to be read together. In essence, reserve strips are something that, that are not used, cannot be used to prevent the extension of a road into another property uh, is the way uh, that was discussed back then. But the judge said that there is no issue of non-compliance with the one foot reserve strip. Uh, and so we believe that Unfortunately, Paul is just incorrect in his reading of those two together. The court's already uh, acted on that issue. I'm sure we'll consider, we'll consider both of your opinions, I'm sure. What? We'll consider both opinions. Yeah. I, I, we've I, we've I seen understand. them both. Um, yeah. uh, the Planning Commission uh, likes the idea that there, we would not have double frontage lots, so their recommendation was uh, for a waiver from that section of the uh, of the ordinance, and and that were we think is a good solution as well. Then that way we don't need to spend a lot of time on the legal side. I think there's a requirement somewhere that waivers be in writing. Could you throw a request in and send it over for any waivers you're requesting so we have them in writing? Sure. Actually, I want to kind of just yeah. piggyback against that. Um, it sounds to me like. Paul and you kind of disagree on some certain things. So in order for you to come up with this list of waivers that you're gonna need, I think you're gonna need to talk to Paul. Can you guys duke this out and then get back to us? I think what Mr. Pollock just suggested is the appropriate way to do it. We believe that a waiver's not needed, but in the alternative, we'll ask for one. We're not going to agree with Paul. Paul is not going to agree with us, and but we're it, not going it to sound, agree with But it him. sounds like there's an awful lot that you guys aren't agreeing with. Well, and I, I think, think if you guys could just sit down and talk about this stuff. We did lawyer to lawyer for two days. I'm not talking about lawyer to lawyer. I'm talking about engineer to engineer. Well, this isn't an, isn't an engineering question. It's a question of the what the ordinance requires and how it's to be read and but what I the think, courts but I, have said. But I also think that there are a lot of outstanding engineering issues, not even just legal issues, but engineering issues that you guys should work out. You have a lot of things that you have not put into your preliminary plan that haven't been approved yet. Like? Or are very outdated. Well, the JD for one. Well, the JD is, we have to provide uh, for a JD. We have no uh, control over a JD. A JD was requested, I believe, in February, and we're in uh, September, and that's just how fast the Army Corps uh, acts. We've given them what they need. You'll get it when we get it. But on the preliminary plan, wetlands and wetland margin areas have to be shown, and the only way that's established is through a JD. But we show them, no, it's not. There's not a requirement to get a JD. There's a, re, there's a requirement to show wetlands and wetlands margins. As many, as, in, in, in as many cases and as many subdivisions as not, in fact, more, the wetlands are determined and accepted by a report from a, a licensed uh, uh, engineer. My question is, is that the plans are supposed to show the wetlands and the wetlands margin areas. That is established by the JD. No, it's established by 
the wetland consultant. It's confirmed and maybe moved by the Army Corps if you ask for a JD. You don't have to ask for a JD. It's a requirement in our ordinance for okay. a preliminary it plan. Is okay. Yes. Okay. Well, so we've asked JD. For okay. So, yes, it expired. Yes, you're right. It, it did expire. It expires after five years. And I noted in your letter that you said that you have solicited one from since February. But again, it's a preliminary plan requirement that a JD, or excuse me, that the wetlands and wetlands margin areas are established. They're established off of a JD approved by the Army Corps of Engineers. Okay. That's fine. If, if, that's, if you believe that that's a reason to deny us, I guess I can't change your mind. Well, we can told, tell you that we've done what we can do. I think your, your uh, mic is on. According to your red line memo, there seems to be an awful lot of issues, not just the one. I mean, that's just one that I thought of off the top of my head. Paul, do you want to? Uh, Stormwater calculation specifics. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I mentioned that the, the, the red line plan with the changes, that's and the post-construction stormwater management plan. Again, uh, there's changes. We don't know what's going on. The, the, but, but right now, we're asking for approval of what's on the plan. Not on the red line plan, what's on the plan. If you want a condition that we make changes to do the other that's fine, we'll do that for final. But our preliminary plan complies. So you're saying we should be deciding not including the red line plan. If we want to incorporate that, we can, but your request to us is that we not consider that, we consider the original. No, we request that you also consider it because we think you may want to condition on that. We don't think you ought to push it aside because at preliminary plan, you have the chance to impose a condition like that that if we accept which we obviously would uh, we would have to do for final plan it's confusing we're looking at both plans part from this one part from that one sounds like uh, I have a question about the bald eagles on the property have any changes been made to the plan based on the eagles nest on the north part of the property uh, so the eagles nest is across the reservoir and uh, now there's one on on your no, property no that's that's been uh, finalized it's non-existent that was uh, a partial nest that was never occupied and we've had several years of people coming back and we've got the documentation that that's not a nest I'm not talking about that nest I'm talking about the one that's on the northern part that has babies in it I have pictures of them this could be news to me yeah, I, yeah. I'm surprised you haven't no. heard of it no okay this is on the Reeves property today yeah Okay. Yeah, when you pull in to the left, um, somebody and gave me a circle of a map and said, here's a nest, and there's babies on it. So pull into the left, pull into the property angle off on a 45 degree angle to the left, and there's a nest right in a, the pine trees. That's where I'm told it is, but I'm pretty sure it's there. Oh, that's I the thought you knew about it. I think the game commission. No, they've been out uh, several times and because there was a partial nest on the southern side of the property, on the Reeves. No, no this is okay. on the northern on part. On the northern side. That's news to me, yeah, Bob. I'll see so. if I can figure out who sent that to yeah. me. That was probably six months ago when they were nesting. Okay. So. I'm not aware of that. Okay. Uh, I guess my last question, do you, when this property. Uh, just, Bob, just, a, and that will affect our plan uh, but not like it was on a, when it was bald eagle was an endangered species. So uh, when that potential nest was on the south side, we had to rearrange a few things. But um, um, so if, if there is a nest there, we may have to rearrange the plan. Okay. Now, I don't know if it's on the Reeves or Aqua or right on the border, but I know it's in that area. So... Uh, I, I, would, I, would just, I would just add, Todd, I, I can see them going into the trees from where I am. So. Okay. So, we'll, we'll so your very opening line on that letter was that uh, East Phillip was laid out to provide access to the Reeves. And the duly approved and uh, recorded submission plan, I guess you're going back to the Voorhees days, 1962. Uh, was there a negotiation back then? by the Reeves to, to gain access because they don't abut 
that cul-de-sac. They're a distance off of the cul-de-sac to the Reeves property. The select sites abuts it. Um, was there some negotiation that they made back then to say, hey, we need a second access and an agreement for a fee or anything to show where this was, I don't know. where they the, have entitlement? The easement, the easement was extended to the Reeves property. The only purpose for the easement was to provide access to the Eaves property. To the now, and you're assuming that was for the Reeves, not for the benefit of East Phillip? I, I, yes. Obviously, I don't think they're, I would have no idea what the benefit for East Phillip would be. If they wanted to extend a road for to their benefit. To the Reeves property. To, <laughs> yeah, to wherever, if they chose to. Well, I understand, well, let me put it this way. It was a dedicated road to the township. The easement runs in favor of whoever it touches, and that's us. Todd, you made a comment in one of the planning commission meetings. I think that after, was it 21 years, the township doesn't have to? The township could not open it, but that doesn't mean that the, the private parties can't. There's a different right there. You recently moved that easement over to be entirely on or was that the new easement, or is that the same easement just moved? What we've done is, in an effort to be neighborly, not and not put a road through an easement that's partially on our neighbor's property, we've extended the easement to give us room to be able to put it only on the select site's property. So the what I've explained is, if the township believes that we for some reason we can't do that, or if a neighbor for some reason tries to sue to do that, we'll go ahead and put it within the, the existing initial 50-foot easement. So right now it's still a 50-foot easement, but it's been moved off of their property onto yours? Is that how no, it's I'm a hearing 50, it? No, it's a 50-foot easement that's one easement. And then there's an easement that takes up about half of that 50-foot easement and another approximately 25 feet that is on select sites. So the original easement is still in place. You created a second easement just on select sites, and that's what you're proposing to use in this plan. That's correct. And as, I, as I've said before, if, if for some reason there's a belief that it has to, the road has to be put in the original 50-foot easement will modify and do that. Any other questions from the board? Public. Anything from above or that way? Yeah, did you uh, want me to continue? Yeah. Oh, Paul, I'm sorry. That's fine, that's fine. Um, uh, comment number uh, 12 on page six of the T&M letter, I note that uh, no fence or wall may be built within the legal right-of-way or within five feet of the cartway, which, uh, whichever is greater, and on Segley uh, Lane on both sides, both the west and the east side, there is a retaining wall that's proposed within uh, the, the, the right-of-way. So there's, uh, there's that conflict as well. And, and you have our answer to that, which is uh, it's already been determined by the court that retaining walls for the roads are accessory to the roads. The section you're citing is the section for people who want to put a wall or a fence on their lot. It's not a road construction one. Uh, so uh, from our standpoint, that what you're citing doesn't apply to the road that is this, the wall, the retaining wall that's accessory to the street. That section doesn't necessarily say anything about just being residential. I know it doesn't, but what the court decision said was when, especially when they were concerned <clears throat> with the crossing there, mm -hmm. that the retaining walls that were part of that, uh, that culvert, which this has got a culvert in the middle of it, uh, were accessory to the road. Well, that in that decision, that was considered a bridge, the one that's going across, no, it's and that's, it, it's, it's it's listed as a bridge in the in the zoning hearing decision, and it also notes that all those abutments and retaining walls, et cetera, that are needed, uh, it was all pertaining to steep slopes and flood hazard district, none of which exist on Segley Lane. Could you orient me which decision was that? We've had a few. <laughs> Sorry, the 2010. Decision. Thank you. <laughs> All right. 
right. Um, again, uh, obviously the concern about the aqua, and uh, with, with the aqua, there are two uh, extensions of uh, outfalls, one from stormwater management A and one from stormwater management B, based off of the, the, the submitted plans of the township. Um, have the easements on the aqua property been granted at this point for those uh, outfalls? They asked us, uh, Aqua would like us to have the outfalls down near the reservoir outside of the floodway, but they would rather the discharge from our stormwater management systems instead of on our property, which is back from the reservoir and at an elevation that sometimes is 10 foot higher. Uh, they asked us if we could extend our outfalls down to the shoreline so that they prevent future erosion. And they said they would grant the, um, um, uh, the right of way uh, or the easements for construction and maintenance of those. But, the, but those that, that are off our property are on the alternative plan. On the main plan, they're not. No, they're on the, they're on the subdivision plans. On the, on the full set that we on reviewed? On which sheet? <laughs> sheet number 15 shows it on uh, for stormwater management B. Well, actually, they're both they're both shown on sheet 13 of 48. Okay, okay. extending to the water line and onto the aqua property on this on this set of plans. Do you want me to show it to you? Uh, show them to Jeremy. property and that's what aqua would like us to do and that's on our alternate sheet okay well if, if i guess are you going to have that resolved with aqua at your meeting whether we there's can, but they we've but, already they've already asked us to do it that way and they said they would grant the easements for it okay so we, when, when we get back with aqua we'll have that clarification yes okay <clears throat> Um, there's a concern about, uh, on Segley Lane, there's a, a culvert that goes underneath Segley Lane. There's an existing 14-inch uh, DIP, and it's being replaced by a 38 by 24 elliptical RCP. The pipe extends right up, uh, it abuts against uh, two of the properties on uh, Dorchester Lane. There is a existing outlet structure and some old stone. Um, right now, the question is that the, 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 the proposed end wall for that culvert is either a foot or 
maybe a half a foot off of the property line. From that point, there's, a, there's stone right there, then there's a gap of no stone, and then there's, the, like I said, the existing stone uh, in the existing basin. Um, our concern is, is that stone has to be installed on the adjoiner's property, and we're asking that some form of agreement be uh, prepared with the applicant and the two property owners to, 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 to be able to put this stone in and then establish who's gonna have the perpetual maintenance of that stone should there be washouts, et cetera. And just to confirm, we did meet with the neighbors. Uh, they asked us to replace the riprap that's uh, existing in their easement right now. And so we would tie both of those together. They also asked us if we would change the type of uh, um, uh, trash rack that's on there right now uh, to a type that uh, is a little bit more favorable. Um, should it get clogged? And, uh, and our homeowners association documentation will provide for uh, a continual maintenance of that new culvert so that we don't wind up um, having a problem that happened a couple years ago where that uh, existing culvert got blocked and uh, became a problem. Okay. Will you be able to have some form of agreement from these homeowners at least acknowledging this? Well, I, or? I will try, yes. Yeah, yeah I just, thank you. <clears throat> um, uh, again, uh, about the JD, that's it's still an outstanding concern. Um, one of the a requirement for our preliminary plan is a is a updated pending and i know you you acknowledged it in your letter that you ran a pending in april but you you haven't gotten a response back yet on the pending paul we did get a response and there were several agencies that needed <clears throat> additional information so todd uh, todd's wetland scientist is providing that additional documentation um, as you know, there's some back and forth with that. So until those items are addressed, the pindy, complete, p complete pindy can't be provided. So we are in the process of addressing any of those comments. Okay. Again, that's a preliminary plan requirement. So it just, it's, you can answer Right, and the, but the pindy has been provided. Not the new, well, at least we, the township hasn't gotten a new one I, I know you're saying about the clearances, but we don't even have the, the one that was run. Okay. So. I, can, I can send you that tomorrow. Okay. Um, again, uh, we noted in our, in our plan that uh, there's a driveway on uh, the parcel on Bel that goes through Belmont Tower. So uh, on Segley Lane on the west hand side is where that Belmont Terrace is, what everyone kind of refers to as no man's land. And there is a driveway that's being proposed for uh, one of the adjacent homeowners to be able to tie in there. Uh, we noted in our review uh, that, uh, you know, we can't just put in a driveway on that, on that land parcel. And I know subsequently uh, on the red line plans, the applicant has, has still shown that and has said that it's gonna be up to the property owner to coordinate everything with the Belmont Terrace for that uh, driveway. Um, it just, it's kind of a, I don't know exactly where this is going because there's a driveway being shown, but there's really no access for the person we're, to tie it. Yeah, we're showing an easement so that if the landowner can get to our property, he can connect to Sedgley. That's the most we can do. We don't have any ability to grant any easement or deny any easement over uh, Belmont Terrace if that landowner wants to uh, get to Route 23 by getting to Sedgley, we've provided on the plan an easement so he can do so. You know, does that landowner have a right to continue using their uh, driveway out to uh, sure. Road? Sure. Sure. Even though it's going to be on a uh, cell lane. I, I don't. Not your problem. It's not my. That's. <laughs> <laughs> we're 
PennDOT has asked us to provide access to Sedgley if the landowner wants to come that way, and that's what we've done. Paul, I want to back up one second regarding the, uh, the Pindy. Wouldn't the eagles normally be on that Pindy? There's uh, an eagle, active eagle's nest there. Uh, they could be if, they, if it's uh, like, they, uh, like Todd had mentioned, they're no longer an endangered species, but they, they could be a potential hit. Bats, bog turtles, they're protected but not endangered. Uh, if, if, if they might be listed. I'm not sure. I haven't seen the pindy to, 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 to note it, but the, any, any species that could be impacted could be noted on it. Uh, there's four different commissions, PA, uh, PA Boat, PA Fish and Wildlife. Uh, I forget the other two. I apologize. But, game uh, Commission. Yeah, the Game yeah. Commission. Then there's a fourth. Um, but those are the four agencies when you run a pindy and you put in the perimeter of the project. They just do, it's a, it's a quick screening and uh, you, get a, you get almost an immediate answer saying what are the potential conflicts of the four agencies? One, two, three, or four might be hits. And then uh, to get the approvals, uh, Bob, you might have to go, sometimes you can do a desktop review where you submit pictures and things like that and that clarifies it for the agencies. And other times you have to bring in licensed professionals to talk about habitats and uh, for anything from an animal to, to, to a flower and fauna. Um, again, I, I, I comment about the preliminary or uh, the post-construction stormwater management plan, uh, the, 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 the confusion with what's going on with these designs. Uh, uh, it, also, it should be noted that, it, again, they've, they've submitted new stormwater management design, but the post-construction stormwater management plan uh, hasn't been updated. So, as I had mentioned before, there's been new infiltration testing done. Some of the structures have, um, or some of the facilities have gone from underground facilities to above ground facilities. Um, uh, drainage areas have changed. So the, 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 the post-construction stormwater management plan as originally submitted to the township back in 2005 or 2006 or, or subsequently is, is, is outdated based off of the plans that we presently have in front of us. But you do have a new narrative. I'm sorry? But you do have a new up-to-date narrative. We do have the new up-to-date narrative. Yes, that was included in your. It was included in your uh, letter, but it should be on a plan. It should be on the post-construction stormwater management plan. That narrative would be included in the report as well as the plan. Um, the. Uh, there's a there's a question regarding the, uh, the, the sewer planning modules. Um, they are to be submitted as part of a preliminary plan. Um, in addition, it should be noted to the board that the, uh, the, the, the system has changed. Now, as represented on the most recent set of plans, uh, the, uh, the, the, the southern side of the project, let's say everything uh, going, when you're looking at the plan on the page there, everything to the left is being serviced by a low pressure sanitary sewer system, which means each house is, uh, is controlled by its own grinder pump. The effluent is pushed into a main and then it will go. And then once it crosses over uh, the bridge and into the other area, it will connect into a manhole where it will go by to a, a gravity feed. Prior, to that revision in the, in the plans, there was a pump station, a, a I don't want to say regional, but it was it was regional for the project that was that was doing the same uh, work. The the effluent from all those lots would go down to it. It would collect into that pump or into that uh, pump station, and then it would shoot it back up to the same sanitary uh, force main. Um, I guess a question right now is number one, the planning module. Uh, we're supposed to get, you know, submitted in triplicate. Do, is there any status update on the current planning module? So we, were, we were holding on until we had preliminary approval uh, to change that, obviously. So, uh, we, you know, right now we, excuse me. Uh, so just to clarify this, the prior plan submission, which was the 94 lot plan, we got submitted the planning module for that. We have capacity and treatment conveyance sign off from the Valley Forge Sewer Authority for 94 EDUs. Since that plan is still um, in play, if you will, or still active, 
we're going to be reducing the EDUs from 94 to 51, 52, because there's 52. the MACLA, right? So 52. So the Act 537 documentation we have from the sewer authority is actually for 94. We're going to be reducing that. So to not negate the 94, we've not revised for the 52. Well, again, this is a preliminary plan. Um, are they still current? Is the, is the planning module still approved and current? As far as we know, yes. So, but they were they were submitted, and if you need that documentation, Paul will provide you that as well. well are, are you reserved, or have you purchased for at least fifty-two? I mean, they they've not been purchased yet. No. Are they reserved? Do they reserve them? So we all we. We have certification from the. Valley Ford Sewer Authority that there's adequate capacity for 94 EDUs for both conveyance and treatment for this site. So the current application 52 was less than 94. Once again, I, we can't remove the other one because as you know, Bill, that plan is still active. Has, uh, has uh, Valley Ford Sewer Authority reviewed the, the revised design yet of, of the low pressure system? Have they offered any comment? They have not. Okay, so, all right, so we don't, all right. Okay. Well, I have a quick question about the, uh, going back to the emergency access. I remember something somewhere along the line about uh, some feedback from our fire company uh, navigating that emergency access was there concerns there that we didn't uh, that our truck couldn't make that turn um, on the Valley Forge fire company letter now the applicant did submit a truck turning template for the emergencies uh, for the emergency access on the on the plan set that's right there uh, subsequent to that um, the Valley Forge fire company uh, letter dated July 21st 2023 um, uh, they noted, and I'll just read it, it should be noted that any potential secondary access roads or bridges should be capable of supporting apparatus in excess of 35 tons and 300 inches in wheelbase. And I, I noted it somewhere, uh, I, the, the wheelbase for 300 inches is 25 feet, and I believe the vehicle that was utilized in the truck turn templates was under 20 was under 20 feet so that'll have to be updated so it's just but as of right now uh what they show on their plans works but the the fire company has asked for a larger truck to be to to utilize that so that will have to be updated to make sure that the, the apparatus can navigate the emergency access did we receive that letter I, yeah. I, okay Um, so, uh, in talking, uh, just to, just for clarification for the board, um, the physical improvements for, uh, the select sites, the East Phillip Drive connections are shown on the reuse track plan. Uh, somewhere along the way that changed, it, it, originally it was shown on select sites as exclusive and Reeves tracks was exclusive. Now the physical design is, is for East Phillip Drive is shown on um, the Reeves track plan. And the reason I'm saying that is because one of these next comments is concerning uh, the East Phillip Drive. And we, we note in our letter based off of those plans that the uh, uh, there's a horizontal uh, radius for when you're going down East Phillip Drive and you're turning into what's the street that's proposed on uh, the plans there, that East Phillip Drive is an existing 27 foot cartway, which would be 13 and a half foot half width. Uh, the curvature starts prematurely, so one lane uh, for about 20 some odd feet goes less than 13 and a half feet. So the travel, the horizontal curve has to be adjusted to accommodate that change on East Phillip Drive for people. If, if this connection or this uh, East Phillip Drive extension is, is, is uh, approved, cars, we have to have the right horizontal alignment to make that work. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, Paul, just 
just to let you know, uh, on the little uh, packet that we gave you, we show how that works. Uh, and it's not on the plan, but it's, a, it's on the red line, so you could take a look at it. Yeah, the, the red lines that I had that I, that I was looking at, I couldn't get the scale to work because the, the plan says it's one inch equals 30, and when I drop scales on it, I can't get it to, on the blow up, so I can't get it to, to scale the way right. that you're saying. And, and even when I'm looking at that, uh, uh, Todd, it does look like it starts to curve early. I don't, it didn't look like it, it was starting at the, the, the PIPT. So, okay, we'll see if we can get you the right uh, plan to look that's at. That's fine. That's fine. I'm just, just noting it. That it was a concern. Uh, we also note, uh, I know this was brought up earlier uh, by Mr. Snyder, but we feel as if the utilization of um, uh, the East Phillip Drive is going to become it's going to become a secondary feeder the extension and and the road itself it's going to go from a cul-de-sac all the way to a secondary feeder we are asking the applicant to design the East Phillip extension just the extension to be the size of a secondary feeder which would be a 60 foot right of way and a 38 foot cartway um, we're not asking the applicant to go on to the existing East Phillip Drive that's an off-site improvement but what we're but what we're noting is that in the event that there is an issue in the future that we have to go and expand the road on East Phillip Drive for increase in traffic, et cetera, we don't want to have to go back and try to, get, we don't want to go from a 60 foot wide road from South Whitehorse, neck it down to 50 feet for this extension and then go into Eagles Point. Um, so that's one of the, what we, we've asked them to revise that extension accordingly. Um, okay, uh, we already talked about double front end. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the access strip. Trying to keep this moving. I apologize. I'm just trying to hit some of the highlighted items. It's obviously it's a it's an extensive letter. Uh, Okay, um, so uh, one of the one of the comments that we had was uh, regarding the uh, we're calling it the Macula property that was the former owner, and we had a concern that on previous plan submissions that there was a driveway being proposed for that property. On that plan that that's in front of us on that table, the the, the driveway connections were removed, um, and subsequently on the plan that was submitted. Uh, on uh, one of the red line plans that just came from Mr. Snyder the other day, uh, they have now shown a, a, a connection going through. Uh, my question will be: Have has anyone reached out to the to the new owner about the realignment of their driveway? Because it doesn't it doesn't align exactly. Are they are they are they do they know this? Uh, no, but I, I will contact. Mm -hmm. So the stone driveway will come up to, and we'll, we will reinstate the stone driveway uh, when we build our cul de sac so they'll have access to it. Okay, no, that's fine. It's just, it's, it's shown and, it, you know, it's just, we want to make sure that they're, they're, they're based off of those plans, they're landlocked and, you know, we want to make sure we got that figured out. Uh, um... And, uh, Paul, we are also, uh, we're also allowing the connection to our uh, store, our sewer system and uh, new uh, gas and electric. So we're going to stub out that five acre parcel so they can have uh, all the new utilities as well. Okay. Yeah, I, I did. I do know that there is the, those, those, uh, the plans do show a stub for both sanitary and, and, and water. Uh, assuming that they presently have water, or excuse me, well and uh, septic. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, um, uh, we've asked for additional plans and calculations about the, uh, the about the bridge and the culverts and the retaining walls and the expected loads on what's going on there. Uh, right now, we have just a, 
a profile view and a plan view of the bridge. The bridge is uh, upwards to almost 20 feet from the bottom of the uh, flow line all the way to the to the top of pavement. And we've asked for some documentation to verify that the uh, that the bridge can handle uh, the the proposed design of the bridge will be able to handle those loads. Quick question, Paul: the uh, the old culvert where they put in the, uh, the corrugated plastic. Corrugated plastic replacing corrugated galvanized of the same size. Is that, in your opinion, a, a much a one and a half times volume increase? Uh, we were the township was involved when that was going through, and it did it did increase the amount of volume. I can't recall it off the top of my head, but it did. It went from a, a I believe it was a an old uh, CMP culvert that over the course of time just rots away. And, and the bottom rots and then the sides collapse with it. Uh, it was, as, as Todd had mentioned, when it was washed out, it, had, it has been replaced with a brand new corrugated uh, HDP pipe. So it should have a good life and, it's, and it is sizable. So it's not so much that galvanized versus plastic, same size, same diameter, same corrugation, is what gain capacity you're saying because of corrosion? Yeah, increased it, capacity. Yeah, it was it was failing. It, it, when when you have a metal pipe uh, and and the bottom goes out, the whole pipe starts to to crumble on itself. It just it loses its arch. It becomes deflected, and uh, and obviously with the storm event, it was completely washed out. And, I'm sorry. And then Bob, the other thing is the roughness coefficient from corrugated metal pipe to either concrete or heavy duty polyethylene, which is smoother. The fl it handles more flow because it's more efficient. That's water pressure drop. The, uh, the calculations of storm water that come down into that area, have they been looked at to see if that bridge will now, you know, that culvert and the, uh, the uh, pavement won't go underwater? Or do you know if that's been run? Well, there, there, is, uh, there was a, a report that was prepared by Chester Valley uh, and we prepare a flood study for Segley Farm, and we prepared a letter dated April 5th, 2023. And it's a couple pages long. It was very technical in nature about the flood study and our concerns uh, regarding the uh, the modeling of, of the bridge and the whole system. When you when you look at a flood study, you 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 can't isolate yourself to just what the the crossing is. You have to look at both the impacts upstream and downstream. So uh, as I'm mentioning right now, we, we, we have a letter uh, from April of this year um, about different questions and, and technical items to be resolved uh, regarding the flood study going through that bridge. So it, 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 if, if the question is ultimately, it, it, <laughs> the, there's about a 10 foot difference between the uh, elevation of the emergency access way and the bridge. So in the event that the water is high up on the bridge, the emergency uh, uh, path would be completely underwater. Culvert, road, et cetera. That is completely out of the question at that point. Okay. Um, we have, we have a, a concern about the, uh, the retaining walls that are shown on Segley Lane. Uh, as I mentioned before, there's walls on both the west and the east side of Segley Lane, and they're, they're, they're close to the existing property lines. Uh, to date, we haven't gotten any uh, uh, details, plans, et cetera, for the construction of how these retaining walls are going to be built. And our concern is that with a wall and then about maybe about a foot and then the adjoiner's property line, the property line being either Belmont Terrace or uh, uh, the properties on Dorchester. Uh, we don't know how this is going to get constructed. Are these going to be tiebacks? Are these going to be leveling pads, et cetera? How are they going to be able to build walls that go from two feet up to five feet within one foot without going on to other properties? So we've asked, uh, we've asked the applicant for some additional information on the construction of those and materials of those. Uh, is that something walls. normally necessary before a preliminary approval? Uh, it's, it's, it's not a requirement, but it's certainly a concern because we don't, if, if, if if we, if we get the details and it looks like they have to go onto the adjoiner's property to do this, if they don't get temporary or potentially permanent easements to do this, uh, you know, it's, we, sh we should know, in my opinion, but it's not a preliminary plan requirement. We're just noting that it's, it's, it, it, it's something that's outstanding that's concerning to me. 
there, I have a lot of different concerns, but that's one of the ones that I, I want to highlight. Um, the again going back to the East Phillip Drive uh, connection um, there's a vertical curve that's required uh, currently it's designed as a grade break and uh, just not to dumb it down but when you're going into the East Phillip Drive uh, there's there's a two percent up and then there's a two percent down off off of the off of the extension and and, and what a grade break is it's an algebraic difference, two, two up, two down. It doesn't go to zero, it goes to four. And the reason why that's a concern and you put in a vertical curve to soften this is so that when a car is going up, it catches and it will drag and it will bottom out. So uh, as, we, as, as was noted in our, in our letter, that, that there's a, we, we wanna see what the vertical curve is gonna be for that design in that location. Um, We do have a response to that in the in the materials we submitted on the sixth. That is correct, but that the the reference or the section you referenced was about driveways, and this is proposed as a street. So a dri a dri if, if it's a driveway, that you can you can get away with. I think I think it's a ten percent, but this is proposed as a street, so you need a vertical curve. <laughs> So just to conclude, th those were some of the more uh, impactful comments that I had in my letter. Now, you know, now there are a lot of comments here that still need to be addressed. Uh, I, di I didn't want to get into the minutia of every single one. They're detailed in, in the review letters, and I'm happy to address any questions that the board might have, any questions that the applicant uh, might have, or of course the public would have. I have one. I know in the Planning Commission uh, there was discussion and I think a recommendation to uh, sort of go off the original plan per our saldo regarding the street width. Uh, I think we had originally 38, um, right? And then it, their recommendation was to go down to what, 28? 30, 30, 30, 32. 32 is what's required. Yes. Down to, what was the recommendation, Mark? Tw 28 feet. 28. And I, got concerns of that personally because of the uh, school buses ingress and egress congestion if somebody uh, does have to stop a car say pulling off the highway and another car goes to go around them and can't mm. are, are we inviting uh, a dangerous traffic issue there well I mean the concern with going down to the 28 feet Bob is that uh, it, it, it will it won't meet the township standards and therefore if a waiver is granted uh, and it's a public street, the buses can go down it. If it's if a waiver is granted and dedication is not taken, uh, it's a private street, and therefore buses won't be able to go down those roads. So if we if we constrict Segley Lane or any other roads in this area, uh, again, I brought this up at the Planning Commission. My concern is that if, if if dedication is not accepted by the supervisors for this road plan, buses will have to pick up the uh, the students. Uh, at the intersection of 23 and Segley Lane. That being said, I think it's fair to assume that on inclement days, and maybe not, uh, children's parents will be parked up on that road, queued up, blinking lights, waiting for their school bus to arrive. So uh, diminishing the width of that road uh, is, is a, it could be a very big challenge. Could be a safety issue, like you said, but I think more, uh, I don't want to say safety is not paramount, but really the, the, my concern would be is that you're going to have a line of cars just all sitting there waiting for the school bus to arrive. Their kids run on the sidewalk, they get into the bus, and then all these cars are doing K-turns to get out. So that's a concern, especially if dedication is not taken on the roads. Just, just, yeah, excuse me, just from a practicality side, 
I built a lot of roads in residential subdivisions, and 28 foot is more than adequate. Uh, and um, if you just take East Phillip Drive, uh, uh, I think it's 27 foot. So, uh, I mean, it's very, t 28 foot is very typical. I'm just finishing a, a little uh, um, uh, place right now where it's 24 foot with houses on both sides. So, um, you know, th through other communities, um, I would say a 32 foot wide road is fairly extensive um, and it, you know, it adds a lot of impervious coverage that we really don't need. So I just kind of throw it out there. The, in 2009, the Planning Commission uh, recommended 28 foot, and I think your current uh, Planning Commission recommended 28, the waiver for 28 foot as well. So I just throw it out on the table. I'm not sure who, to, I'm not sure who, maybe Lori, oh, sorry. Maybe Lori, I, I don't know if you would be able to answer this or Paul. Um, does the width of our road affect the liquid fuels funds that we get? Or is it just the dedication and not dedicated? Oh, here, I'll turn it off. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, we have too many on at once. <laughs> um, I don't believe the width, it's kind of a loaded question, but we only get liquid fuels funding for roads that are dedicated to the township. So that's the only? That's correct, we okay. do not get, we don't do any, on a private road, we don't maintain it, mm -hmm. we don't get any money for it. Mm -hmm. um, and generally speaking, to accept dedication of a road needs to be in compliance with the township's ordinances. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Public, would anybody like to say anything? I have a question. Um, sure, come on up and sure. we know who you are. But. Uh, Leslie Lane. Um, I'm, a, I'm opposed to this plan. I think there's a lot of flaws to it. Um, I appreciate the careful attention that you all are uh, applying to this because I think it's, it's something we're all going to have to live with. Um, I'm glad it's not a uh, rocket ship that we're going to launch with a manned spacecraft because approve it and then we'll work out all the details later. Um, it seems to be the, the theme of, the, of this uh, applicant. But um, the, uh, the question I have is, is there a township road that you have uh, control of that has a gate of some sort? Does that exist or is that going to be a, a new? Let me answer that. Oh, okay. I was going to say. No, we can't have a gate on a township road. Okay, so this, this East Phillips, it seems like it's like the line's moving. I, I came to the planning commission meetings and the, you know, the, the sort of preemptive pitch was we've decided to accommodate by offering a private road with a gated access and only uh, the residents being able to use it. And then it seems like that's kind of, let's clear that hill. And then once we've cleared it, then We'll revisit it uh, as needed with an another group of people, another governing authority. So I just feel like the sincerity level is not there. And I guess I, I challenge the idea of piercing through a cul-de-sac in the first place for the benefit of the East Phillips people. Um, and then secondly, you're, you're setting precedents with gates, with, with roads that may or may not be you're asked to decide on that. I, I just don't think, I think it's an incomplete, flawed plan. And I think it always has been. And that's, you know, that's my two cents. Thanks, John. Yeah. Hello, uh, Mike Busia, 845 East Phillip. Uh, I'm not going to rehash everything with the Planning Commission, so I'll keep it quick. Uh, so the question of breaking through the cul-de-sac, I understand there's an easement that's already there or has been there since perhaps, perhaps 1964. When an easement's there, it, it does attach to a public road. So at what point in time does the township uh, approve the access to that road? And I guess that's an education question for myself. That's one for Bill. When does the so there's an easement in place. The access? Yes, yeah, an easement in place, but it attaches to a public road. 
is there an approval process to allow for that easement to, you know, break through the cul-de-sac is the question. What kind of approval is necessary for the township? Well, Mr. I'm going to pass this to Mr. Snyder. I think he's going to say no approval is necessary. Um, okay. I'm trying to figure out what you're asking. If somebody builds a house on the uh, cul-de-sac, uh, they just connect. So here it's a little bit different because the cul-de-sac doesn't connect, the bulb of the cul-de-sac doesn't attach to the Reeves property. Correct. But um, uh, I mean, I guess if the township approves the plan, they are giving their blessing to this connection. Okay. Although I don't know, you know, there's an issue about whether the, um, uh, the road is going to be public or private. If it's private, it still needs to be approved. So the question is whether the township has the authority to refuse the request to connect. It goes the other way. So, you know, everybody has rights. You have rights, they have rights. Okay. It's a balancing act and we have to figure out the right balance. Correct, okay. So then this easement that, that is there, um, I've read some state statutes, chapter 17, section eight, and it talks about the connection of a street. A period of time that a street has not been opened, it's 21 years, there's an approval process that has to happen from the um, abutting properties, 51% majority to vote to reopen that street. That's the, that's that, the that borough different? code, that, that's not the township code, that's okay. the borough so, code. So the, the, the state code not take, dictate in this case? Yeah, there are different regulations about all of that. I, this 51% stuff is in the borough code and it's not relevant it's to the township code. Okay, so we don't make any assimilation to a borough code, which is a state you know, article, if you will. They the basically code, this, the, this is a second class township, and I hate when they say that. I thought we were like first class. <laughs> <laughs> the second class township is a separate code that uh, deals with uh, uh, roadways and things of that nature. The question is whether or to what extent it applies here. That's, that's my question and that I raised to the board. Um, the other question I had was, um, so there wasn't a ordinance put into place about breaking through a cul-de-sac five or six years ago. It could be longer, I don't know what it is. is. And this plan was in place since 2006. Is there a statute of limitation of how long a plan can be out there before these new ordinances come, come into play. In this case, we had a standstill agreement okay. where in order to look in another direction um, for a PRD, a planned residential development, township and the developer agrees to freeze things in place. So we are obligated to uh, uh, review this plan based on the older ordinances and it's been a challenge because you know you got to find these old ordinances and use them but I think we've been successful in uh, using the right uh, text in reviewing the plan. Okay so so in this case because it was frozen there is no theoretical statute of limitations exactly. on that. Okay and then the other question I had was on easements in general that need to be granted um, by to, to Poland from I guess Aqua so there's a easement that's perhaps on the public site which they have to grant aqua the, e the easement I guess re reverse grant there's a uh, high pressure water line running through from from the dam I think it ends up in Malvern somewhere is there another easement that we all need to be thinking about from a um, from a um, approval or, or granting an easement by aqua that um, hasn't been brought up before I mean it's a question for for Todd yeah, so right now there's Can you get the microphone, Todd? I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, currently, there are two water lines to traverse from the north side to the south side, and they are under the existing uh, driveway, which has the new culvert under it. So those lines are in place. There's an easement from the Rees allowing them for the, those water lines to stay there. The second easement was granted by uh, Aqua so that we could have our new road crossing from the north side to the south side, that blue area, uh, and because they preferred that we cross from north to south at that location rather than where the original crossing was. So there's no additional easement needed on Eastville Drive, Township Property, I guess? 
What? I'm not sure. To the, uh, I guess to the north of the ball, there's a property there, and I'm talking to the neighbor. There's a high pressure line that runs under his property, which I would assume runs pretty close to the to the ball of the, uh, the culvert. Yep. So uh, those those, as I understand the lines, uh, they're coming from Aqua, headed up here. They traverse across the property. They go along this driveway, and then they further uh, go along uh, lot 43, the way it's shown, headed back up there. Okay, so no additional easement. We're sure that there's nothing that's required. Not that I know of, yeah. And, uh, so that's it. But I think the irony, as Todd kind of said it today, as he builds his cul-de-sac, so he can build his cul-de-sac but take ours. So uh, those are the questions I have for today. Uh, appreciate your time. We have concerns there, too. We've yeah. been talking quite a bit about that, and there's more talk to be done. And uh, you know, the, the secondary feeder has been discussed for years about, uh, you know, streets that are now no longer a cul-de-sac are going to continue through. So there's a lot of dis discussion and uh, thought that still has to go into that. Perfect. Thank you. Hello, uh, Frank Mercurio, Spruce Grove Lane. Uh, comment and a question. A comment is I, I have a lot of concern about the apparent disconnect between aqua and the pollock folks having been in similar situations in business before i can absolutely understand how two groups could come out of a meeting and have totally different uh, perspectives as to what happened normally in a meeting like this i would assume that someone was taking minutes or had notes or whatever apparently not <clears throat> pardon me but I'm, I'm very uncomfortable with moving forward with this until this disconnect is resolved, whether it's by Aqua sending another letter saying, oh, no, we were wrong, everything's fine, whatever. But I think it's very important that that be resolved before you go forward. My other question is more, more of, a, of a legal question regarding homeowners associations. So as I understand it, at some point after the construction is completed, uh, the construction company, Polig, backs away completely out of the picture and the homeowners association then has full autonomy over what happens uh, in the development. So I guess my question is, can, can the homeowners association be structured in such a way that if this is approved with a gate, that that gate is there in perpetuity? Uh, I would hate to see five years from now uh, someone says, you know, we got to repair this gate. We don't really have the money. Let's just let it go. You know, forget that. We, issuing decals is too much trouble. We don't want to do that anymore. We don't get any benefit out of it. Let's just let it go. Can they be precluded? Uh, can, can the Homeowners Association of the future be precluded from doing anything to change the, that restricted access? Fortunately, that is a very simple answer. Uh, to be able to do that as a driveway, it's going to be a waiver issued by the board. That waiver binds the property, and the property owner can't uh, disassemble what was there required for the approval of the property. So I'm confused. So. You're calling it a driveway now, but earlier it was a street. No, the street doesn't have a gate. <laughs> So it's not a street. It's a driveway, <laughs> a private driveway. No, let, let me. I'll say it one more time. I'll say one more. I'll say one more time. You make call it, it a private driveway in your I'll, letter. I'll, That's why I'll, I keep asking. I'll, I will say it one more time to make it very clear. Those plans have a street. The street does not have gates. We couldn't put a gate on a street. We've offered the street for dedication. So the question of whether it's a public street or a private street is a township decision. You have to decide whether you would accept dedication to it. Now, in dealing with this for 17 years, we've talked about gating. We know we can't gate a private road. So what we have offered uh, is a gate system on what would be a private driveway. 
which would require a waiver. So it's up to you whether you want it to be a private driveway with gates or the street that the plans show. So which one are we addressing? You you You're asking us to decide what we want and change your plan? No, we've offered like we have on waiver sets, sheet 43 I think is the waiver set. Yeah. Okay. We have offered a, a waiver option to the township. We can't grant waivers, only you can grant waivers. We think, and the Planning Commission has recommended, the waiver for a gated private driveway. Uh, we're requesting that, but to protect ourselves because if you deny it, we don't want the plan turned down. We've shown a conforming public street uh, on the plan. So if you deny the waiver, what's approved is the street. If you grant the waiver, what's approved is the gated private driveway. I'm not following all that. I'm, it's getting late, but uh, I thought that you said that if it's a public, if, if, if it's a private street, you can't put a gate on it. You can put a gate on a private street, correct? Why can't you put a gate on a private street? Because it's a street. Streets aren't gated. There's not a provision in your ordinance to gate a street. street. All right, hold on. So if it's a driveway, you can gate it. Yes. Here we go again. Yes. So we have offered a waiver set of a private drive that would be gated. And that would be up to the board as to whether they <clears throat> grant that. If they grant that, it's part of the approval process, part of right. the required plan. So and both, can't, both, both to answer his question, it can't be. So both of these have concerns regarding our saldo and the classification. Paul, can you give me the classification of what a private drive is? Uh, I'd like to give you the definition. I'm not sure if I have it as a private drive, but it's, I can give you the definition of It's a, a private drive. driveway or? Um, uh, I can I, tell I, you. I, I, think oh, wait, here. I, think, I, I think the confusion is generally in the classification of whether it's a street, a driveway, or or whatever is in the saldo. Uh, and I, I think that driveway doesn't technically apply here, Mr. Snyder. I'm, I do zoning every single day, so mm -hmm. <laughs> bear with me. Uh, driveway doesn't really apply here, in my opinion, and uh, it's, it's well, a little off, it, off kilter. But regardless, you'd still need a waiver one way or another. And if you have a street going through there and you're asking for a waiver, for a gate on a private street, it might be a little more accurate just for the sake of discussion here. That's fine. If you I, want to call just, it that way, that's just, fine Just to us. reduce right. confusion. But, uh, but what he's saying is if it is a street <laughs> and it's going to fall under that classification, it can't be gated. Well, I, unless you wa issue a waiver. If you want to issue a waiver. There is nothing a, in shadow for a private street. Yeah. It's either a private driveway or a residential street or a secondary street. feeder. If, yeah, if the township but doesn't accept dedication of the roadways, it automatically becomes a private street. Drive. Right, and not drive. And if it okay. if it's private it's, street, can't have a driveway. You're asking for that waiver. I just I just want it it, be, to be clear when we're approving things. If you so want to issue it as a <laughs> waiver for a <laughs> private street with a gate, we'd accept it that way. We don't care which way it is. The question is whether you want that connection gated. That piece is understood. And we uh, and we <laughs> we've offered that it requires a waiver. Gating that by Judge Bortner's decision precludes East Phillip from being a secondary feeder. That's the What's decision that was overthrown that you think no, wasn't overthrown. No, that or? wasn't part of what was reversed. It isn't. When a decision is reversed, isn't it reversed in its entirety? Well, it depends. We have to read the decision and see uh, uh, what issues were taken up on appeal. If an issue is not taken on appeal, then it's presumably uh, still binding. So you have to look at the opinion and see what was appealed. So, um, let me ask another question. Uh, it's hypothetically, if this arrangement were to be made for the uh, uh, for the uh, uh, gate and the uh, uh, property owners only, what kind of deed restriction would have to be placed in the record to make sure that that arrangement is permanent? Uh, 
that would actually not even have to be a deed restriction because it would be part of your grant of the waiver. It would be the requirements of the waiver. So, the waiver so that only a, that could be changed by the board. So the waiver would be on the plan, I presume. The waiver would be on the plan and the, and the requirements of the waiver would be on the plan or in the resolution of the board granting the waiver. We could do it, we could record that as a part yeah, of I the, think, you know, but if that's, it gets this far, I think it should be a separate document because you've got 48-page plans with uh, notes all over them. These things get lost, right? Mm -hmm. All right, we can. Yeah, uh, although it's funny, most municipalities, when you have a zoning decision and so forth, say, put it on the recorded plan. So it's recorded someplace. So well, we, can do, right. we can do we'll either, do either or both. We have no problem. We're, any more comments from the residents? Can you give us your name and address, please? Sure. Uh, Amanda Petty, 26 Dorchester Way. So I'm one of the neighbors that shares the culvert in question. Um, just to, I'm sure everyone knows, but the incident that happened with the stormwater was that my neighbor almost died. It was more than just an incident. Uh, this isn't, so I'm not opposed to this plan because I do think it will solve a lot of stormwater issues that the Dorchester neighbors and the people on, we're calling it Sedgley Lane, are having right now from all of the runoff from this development and all of the runoff. It's not being properly maintained. No one is maintaining the road. It's full of potholes, downed limbs. The Belmont Terrace is a disaster. All of the sticks clog the culvert. The culvert backs up and floods my neighbors, thankfully not mine, because I'm a little bit higher, but floods the, the yards of the three neighbors to the right of me, and my senior neighbor was trying to unclog it during the hurricane and fell in, was trapped, was being sucked into the culvert so with so much force that it sucked his boots off. My husband had to jump in, which was very stupid of him, but he did anyway, and pull him out. So that is the incident that happened. This is a very serious issue, and I do think I've met with Todd multiple times. I've met with Polig. I'm in the construction and engineering field. I think we have come to a reasonable resolution for excavating that culvert, adding new riprap, making it a little bit safer, as well as his solution to add drainage on the road to move that away from our homes and our development. I think it's a good solution. I have seen the other plans. They were terrible. We're back down to 50 houses. I think out of bad options, this is the least bad option we've seen as nice single family homes that will add to the value of our community. That being said, I it's it stinks to have to break through a culvert. It does, but it's also terrible for our neighbors to have the entire burden of these houses in our backyards. East Philip is a road it's a driveway it's the front yard they have sidewalks they have a road it's not their private space this is our backyards where our kids play and i i just it's i am suggesting as a mother of two little kids who play in the backyard every single day i know there's this whole thing back and forth between the road width but the 28 feet i i also build roads every day i work at a local university i do this constantly I go before boards for work I don't see a problem with 28 feet we do it all the time I have roads that are 19 feet and box trucks and deliveries go past each other every single day as well as uh, you know we don't have legitimate school buses but we have other buses that transport students there's no issue there's never been a backup there's never been anyone like queuing and people can go around them just fine I sent Laurie um, I don't know if everyone has seen them. My printer broke. I was going to print them out. So I'm really sorry. I just have the world's tiniest image. But if we keep this road at 38 feet, with the retaining wall as close to my property as is legal, this is what it looks like now. And this is what it will look like with an image of a child and a box truck. I just like, want everyone to see this. So I, I think, Paul, you have these images. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if we make the road less wide and push it back from our neighborhood on the, on the west side, <coughs> there is a 58-foot buffer between the road and those homes. We have no buffer. They have Belmont Terrace. We have nothing. 
So this will be right on our property. There's 58 feet of wooded treed area on that side. Again, Dorchester has a fence, if that. And then earlier in the meeting, there was a comment about not having a fence within five feet of a property. I was wondering if someone could explain that to me because if this does go through, I'm going to be putting up a very big fence. Um, and I want to make sure that that's fine. We can't approve it tonight. <laughs> well, I don't. I want to make sure that somehow, like when this happens, I'm not missing something. That now the Dorchester neighbors are no longer allowed to put up a fence to protect our children. The the comment has to do with a fence or a retaining wall within the right of way. So that's why with with Segley Lane being a, a certain size, they're putting a retaining wall and a fence or, or guide rail, et cetera, within the right of way. That was the comment. not affect the edge of my property, correct? No. Okay. No, that's, that, that, that is, it, it, it talks specifically about the carway. Okay. Um, and my last comment is, I think the gate is a great idea. We, I went to all the, like most of the planning commission meetings, if not watched every single one of them, the cut through for the traffic will absolutely happen. 23 is a nightmare. White Horse is a nightmare. Everyone is trying to avoid that intersection. I think the gate is great. I'm not even going to pitch a huge fit about the fact that all the deliveries will now be in my backyard, box trucks, Amazon, UPS, FedEx. Um, my only ask is that they can exit through if like, I know you can't enter because it was supposed to be like the RFID on the side of the card, but is that the case for exiting as well? Because again, it's not it's not fair to I know NIMBY not in my backyard, but like that screws us and it saves them. So I think to share the burden of this project, sure they can't enter, but can they at least exit? And then so they're entering one side, so it's one flow of traffic for all these deliveries. Because Amazon comes about 14 times a day to everyone's house anymore. Because you can't come in without the code. So we have to do, we have to do one at a time. Sorry. So I think what, what, and I had a similar question, if access can be given to exit the property without requiring um, you know, some type of card or whatever the, the word is that you used, um, then it will encourage a cut through, right? Everybody could come off 23, yeah, they knowing they can cut it. the corner and go down. And did we finish a traffic uh, review of entrances. the intersection of East Phillip and White Horse? Or we can have we, put a gate at both sides. I don't know. Didn't we, we request that? Or something. We did. We did request the uh, what's going on there with the number of travels going through, et cetera. Uh, I, I think that was listed also in uh, the Safe Highway Engineering uh, review as well. Just what's what, what are going to be the impacts at South White Horse and East Phillip Drive intersection? So we'll have to talk about that too. I mean, the last thing I'm going to say is that if, and again, if East Phillip is, is maintained, it's just, it's taking the burden away from them and just placing the burden somewhere else. Like there will still be burden and now it's okay, they're safe, but now our development is going to have, you're not going to be able to turn left on, on, onto 23 because we already talked that to death at the planning commission. So everyone will turn right and they'll turn right again into our development. They'll make a U-turn and then they'll turn right or left out of our development. It happens all day long already from the development across the street. We're one of the only developments that doesn't have two points of access, so we are allowed to turn left or right because we don't have a choice. There's nowhere else for us to go. So across the street, there's a cop that sits constantly outside of the intersection right now and pulls people over every five minutes for illegally turning left in the mornings during the zone. They just ignore it. Um, and sure, great, so we could put a cop there, but then they're just gonna turn right, do a legal U-turn in our development, and then turn left, because it's legal out of our development. So, that's all, thank you. Thanks. I just, I just like to add a, a comment to the Dorchester people. Um, this assumption that the 52 homes is a fix, a fix, so that everyone else has to accommodate, either Dorchester loses or East Phillips loses. I mean, breaking through a cul-de-sac where people, you know, they selected that for the safety. There are no sidewalks over there, by the way. Um, you know, there is, a, there is another option, and it's shrink this project down so it fits the envelope 
that you invested in, you took the financial risk. It's not up to our township to accommodate, you know, in perpetuity um, in ways that cause, you know, uh, inconvenience if not risk. I mean, taking a left out of East Phillips is flat out dangerous, and it's not about pruning bushes. It's the contour of the road itself. Um, so, you know, you don't need to lose, the East Phillips people don't need to lose. Um, you know, the Pollock company can re reimagine this project to fit the actual envelope of the property that they invested in. That's it. Well, there's safety concerns on both sides that we're looking at. So I can appreciate what you're saying. Karen Hilliard, 920 Valley Forge Road. I just had a question, if someone could clarify. Um, the red line driveway access from 920 Valley Forge onto Sedgley, um, there was a question of um, can that address still use the existing driveway if it ends into a deceleration lane? And then I heard multiple not my problem. So I wanted to know if you could clarify whose problem it would be. Is that a, a PennDOT issue or a 920 Valley Forge road? It's not a, it's not a legal problem with PennDOT. PennDOT has asked us to uh, provide an easement so that that person can, if they don't want to exit at that spot, uh, can come onto Sedgley and exit. And that's what we've done. They, PennDOT asked us to provide that accommodation. So there's no way that PennDOT can deny PennDOT us. Can't. So I just have to ask, is that easement crossing the Dorchester Way paper road that's in Belmont there? Terrace. Or Belmont Terrace uh, paper road? Um, we had a, a, a study done, and um, it's unclear who the owners are. Somebody put in a uh, statement of adverse possession, someone named Rossi in the 80s. Right. I think um, he's just, I think you're just asking if the easement is being shown going across Belmont Terrace? Yes. I think the easement is just being shown on their property. If they want to connect it to their property, they would have to get an easement or access to Belmont Terrace. But uh, to follow up on that, there's you're saying that no, there's no known owner. Well, yeah, I mean, we looked into it. Someone could go to court and ask a judge to, you know, declare it to be yours or somebody else's. There's a subdivision plan from somebody, Ray Brown, from the 20s or 30s or something. Yeah. And it was partially constructed and partially not constructed. So this area is of unknown ownership. Okay. Now, it can be resolved if this is what courts are for, but it would cost a lot of money to figure out whose it is. I think if you were to you know, put your driveway in, I'm not sure there's going to be anybody who's going to object but there could be, I don't know. We're not uh, telling you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 we, and I think the Rossies are gone. Were they former owners of your property? Russo was. Russo, Russo. there so you go. Russo, Russo and then Sadu and then us. Well, in the 80s, the Russos filed a paper in court saying, we own this. Okay. Now, I don't think they took the next step to file a lawsuit for adverse uh, a possession, which is expensive, mm -hmm. but they have at least put a marker in and I don't think they went to the Board of Assessment to say, we own this because you get your property reassessed and your taxes go up. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a ball of confusion, unfortunately. Um, it can be resolved, but it would be expensive. Okay. So to follow up on that, so Paul had brought up the issue of the retaining wall being potentially too close to, like, I guess, the, the, the retaining walls being within the cartway of Sedley Lane, within the cartway right away. Right, and saying that you may need easement to get from Belmont Terrace to Sedgley, but if no one knows who owns Belmont, would that, wouldn't that be an issue of how to build that retaining wall? Yes, and that's why I listed it. We don't have any design information on the retaining walls right. at this point, so that's the, that, that is a concern that's listed in our review letter. And my other um, concern is um, back in that property now, it's very nice and dark and not a lot of light pollution. I just would like to consider as minimal amount of traffic, uh, street lights 
as possible to minimize the amount of light pollution. That's all. Uh, I just wanted to give you one other uh, tip, and that is uh, since you are in the chain of title from Rousseau, if Rousseau, in essence, did satisfy a claim to uh, Belmont, you need to look in your predecessor's deed and your deed to see whether there was a together with any right we have in, in Belmont Terrace, because you may be the party that has the right to control that. Again, in terms of street lights, um, it's, it has been noted that nobody really wants to light up that driveway. So uh, proposed right now is a street light at the intersection of Valley Forge Road and then all the way through the property to the first intersection would be the next light. And then we also said that uh, it's the supervisors kind of make the decision if they want, if you don't want the street lights, we won't put them in. My suggestion is we have street lights at the intersections and the end of the cul-de-sac that are appropriate and have down lights. So, uh, but uh, you guys make a decision on street lights. Um, I go along with it whatever way. Yeah, the ordinance is that it, it's, we put them in where you want them. Who would pay the electricity for those? Well, if it's private street, that would be paid by okay. the homeowners association. If it's that. a public street, it may still be the homeowners association. It depends on what how that's negotiated at the dedication. Okay. Any other public comment? Okay. So if you can give us your name and address. Hi, Sue Aaron Shield, 130 Valley Park. Um, it, my only question was about the uh, storm management or the submission that was made in 2006 of how you deal with storm management. Is that correct? I'm not sure if I'm putting it right, but sorry. Yeah. Uh, no, not really. What stormwater management is a stepped process. We design to your, to the township ordinance. We then go and get NPDES permit through the county uh, district and DEP. And that's where the final plan rests. The stormwater management plan, it, the PCSM, it's post-construction stormwater management plan. That's really finalized on what comes out of that final permitting through the state after we've gone through here. And it tells, it, it, it establishes what the facilities are that need to be maintained and who's going to, how they're going to be maintained in the future. So that's why there's a narrative of it, mm -hmm. which deals with the who and, and how, and there's a plan of it as to what they are. My, my only concern was that um, the calculations, are they based on the 2006 rain or current? I mean, all that. Okay, good. Thank you. That's all. Anybody else? Okay. Yep, we're going to jump back into the agenda. Thank you for coming out and answering all the questions. We need to discuss the extension. Oh, right. Oh, yeah, uh, dates. Uh, hold it. Yep. Don't go. Dates, dates, dates. Everybody get out your calendars. We've got to talk about a date between before October 27th to get together again. So, so, so everybody knows there's a I announced the decision date or to, the, to the public. Yeah. So for anybody that's, uh, that's leaving, you guys, uh, before you go, we've, we're going to discuss a date for a final decision on this. Uh, it won't be at our next business meeting. We're going to have to probably put a date together for a special meeting after Bob, that business Bob, meeting. One, one sec. Um, excuse me. Could, hey could guys. we all quiet down a sec? I, hey can't, guys, can I can't hear a word he's yeah. saying, and he's right oh, next to me. Thank oh, you. I get to use this. So what I was saying is we're going to have a special meeting sometime in October. We're discussing that now. 
So for anyone that would want to attend, keep your eyes and ears open. It won't be at our normal business meeting on the second Wednesday in October. It'll be probably within the next two weeks after that. Okay. So the, the, dates that, the dates that the applicant have proposed are October 9th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 23rd, 24th, and 25th. Um, the, I can do the any township, of those except for the 9th. Let me write those down again. Ninth. The township has conflicts already on... The 16th, we already have a meeting, so we can't do that day. The 18th, as well, is out. So how does everybody, um, what about, Martha gave me dates that she said. What dates are you not here? Just the 9th. Okay. I will be here, but I will be extremely jet lagged. Yeah, it could, could be yeah. fun. Yeah. Yeah. Would you have actually four days that week because you also have your work session where you could advertise that? We do, um, but we also have budget meetings we have to schedule tonight, okay. unfortunately. Okay. What about the 17th for everybody's schedules? Do you have my list there? Yeah, I have your list. Am I good the 17th? You are good the 17th. Only the red ones were not good for you, right? Correct. Okay. 17th works 17th. for me. Tuesday, 17th. October 17th. Mark, does a Tuesday work I'm working for you? Through my various calendars. Okay. <laughs> I, I think that works for me too, Lori. Okay, great. That one That one's good for you? For now. <coughs> Good to go. Okay, so Tuesday. Perfect. So Tuesday, October 17th. Wow, that was easy. <laughs> so how about a time? I would appreciate it if we could do it not at 6. 7? Seven? 7's fine for me. Okay. All right. So Tuesday, October 17th at 7 o'clock. And we've indicated that we would pay the advertising. Perfect. Thank you for the consideration of moving it from your left. Sure. I was going to ask you to drive all through the night that it has to be at 9 o'clock in Savannah, Georgia. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you guys for moving along. I can find the agenda. We are at. Uh, I had a subdivision land. The next day is old business. We have none. New business. Appointment of Valentina Mitterer. I got it right. Of the, to the position of Assistant Township Manager, effective Monday, September 11th, 2023. I will make that motion. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Any discussion? Public comment? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Welcome Aye. Aye. Official, welcome aboard. <laughs> all right. And she only had to sit through all of that to get it. <laughs> <laughs> My initiation. Yeah. You got to see a little fireworks. Okay, consideration of acceptance of 2024 minimum municipal obligation MMO for the Schuylkill Township non-uniform pension plan and police pension plan and the amount of, and I'm going to turn this over to Lori yep. to uh, discuss a little bit. Get myself together here after that for a second, but um, so it's a little bit uh, more complicated of conversation this year than it's been in the past because we've got options. Not great ones, but we've got options this year that we don't usually have for the MMO. So we're required to adopt this. Um, we have to do it at this meeting. This is the minimum municipal funding that we have to put into the pension plan. So for 2024, 
we're seeing a pretty sizable increase in our funding requirements for both the uniform and non-uniform plans, and that's due to across the board losses in 2022. Everybody was at about 15% or more. Um, our pension funds, we saw asset losses of about you know, close to two million in our pen, in our police pension fund and non-uniform about seven hundred thousand. So we have to make up for that. So as a result of having to make up for that, our funding for twenty twenty four is going up. So the question for the board tonight is: We have two options that have been presented to us by our actuary. One is a smoothing option, which is normally how our MMO is calculated. That's traditionally how you see the number come up. The other option is to go with market value of assets. <laughs> It's a higher number, um, but that will set us up better in the long run. So for 2024, the funding, the MMO based on smoothing for the police pension plan would be $214,412. For the non-uniform, again, the smoothing option would be $76,348. The market value of assets for the police pension plan would be $365,881. The market value of assets for the non-uniform would be 123423 So, so the losses that much? Uh, here, Mike. I'm sorry. Yeah, the, the, the losses were that much? Yes. I was surprised too because the, the market hasn't shown that much as, as much as it went down but we're also a whole year behind so all of these numbers are based off of full um, as of January 1st 2023 so that's how they do their actuarial calculations but yeah there were and it's not just us I mean this is everybody and we're in we're, we're in, in good, good shape. shape the concern is that we will fall behind so here's my suggestion Whatever we put on this piece of paper, we have to do, and we have mm -hmm. to do one of those two options. There's no flexibility there. What we can do is lock in, uh, we set our MMO at the smoothing level, so the lower numbers, mm -hmm. like we do every year, mm -hmm. but we budget for the higher numbers, and that gives us the flexibility that we can wait and see how the pension plan has done and how we have done, and that way if we have additional money in our budget if we can do it we should put in the higher number but commit to the lower so we hit the minimum we have flexibility to go more if we have to correct and that sets us up well um, I would recommend based on my conversation with our actuary that if at all possible we do the higher number but this way it just lets us budget it lets us plan a little bit more conservatively I'll budget for the higher numbers but this just gives us that wiggle room should something happen throughout the course of the year that when it comes time to pay the MMO. So we're committing to 290 total between the two. Mm -hmm. Could go as high as 500 or close to it. Yeah. If, mm -hmm. uh, if we're 78. That's right. You know, I think if I recall correctly, and this is before any of you guys were on the board, I think we were in this situation back in like 2012 or 2010 or 20, I'm sorry, 2012 or 2013. Is that when we and adjusted I, our goals to a little bit lower Yeah, level? and I think that that's what we did. I think we kept it at the smoothing, budgeted higher, and I think there was one year where we just kind of did in between because mm -hmm. we ended up with, I don't want to say leftover money at the end of the year. I never like saying that, but we spent less than we budgeted for and we had that money and it was, it just made sense to do it. Right. But I think yeah. we only had to do that once yeah. in the entire time I've been on the board. Yeah. And we've had pretty good success and our, our pension plans, our pension plan manager is phenomenal. We, mm -hmm. we do really, really well with it. It just was an unprecedented time uh, mm -hmm. all pension plans across the board lost a lot of money and they do the actuary the, these reports what is it every two years or every Correct. three years every two. every two years I'd like to hear some more details of how that happened because when I look at my own investments in the market everything's mm -hmm. doing well and going up uh, I know they hedge some things and balance it out it must have taken a hit 
in a way that I don't understand yet, but I think our next meeting will have a lot of questions for them of how that happened and what they're doing in the future. Yeah. So, okay. all right, I'll make the motion that we, uh, give me those numbers again. I'll make the motion that we add to our budget uh, smoothing for the, for the MMO of pension seven, plan is, pension plan amount of 76. Uh, the police pension plan is 214,412. So that number. And, and the non-union is 76,348. So how do I phrase that motion? Did I make You're the, good. You can just right, you go ahead and, yeah. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Oh, and, uh, discussion Sorry. questions. Sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does that catch you up? Um, also, we are we're not really behind. Oh, I thought you had point. said you were. It, we're talking about being conservative so as to not get behind. Okay. Great. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank Aye. you. Bye. Uh, discussion and possible motion to approve transfer of funds from Open Space Commission account at s and Bank to Pennsylvania Local Government Investment Trust, uh, otherwise known as Plagate. I will make that motion. Here a second. Any discussion? We all know what that yes. is, and it's been mm -hmm. doing very well. So any concerns, questions from the public? I can all explain the, well, right. I'll wait till the next one. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Authorization to close the account at S&T Bank. I'll make that motion. Second. Do you want to do some explaining now or? If you need it. No, um, I don't think we do. It was, it was a dormant account, so we're going to just move the money. All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Authorization to advertise and sell the following equipment on Municipid to the highest bidder, which consists of a 2008 Ford F550 truck with Western nine foot power angle snow plow, 2013 galleon dump body with Western eight and a half plow angle snow plow, or uh, eight and a half foot power angle snow plow, Kubota M9000 frame and front bucket, as well as a Frontier WC 1205 wood chipper. I will make that motion. I'll second. Discussion? Questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Boy, Nick's uh, cleaning out the He's garage. The house. Does yeah. he want to come to clean out my garage? I <laughs> <laughs> might have to take a look at Municipal on that one. Uh, consideration approval of purchase of a 2023 Ford Mustang Mach E in the amount of $57,503 minus the trade in value of $10,000 for a total of $47,503. And um, I will make that motion. I'll second. Any discussion? Comments, and this is for the car that we almost got uh, a couple months ago that was sold out from under us after we had it locked in, but we did find another. So this has been the never-ending story of looking for a car. Hopefully tomorrow, <laughs> yeah. when we go to place the order, it will still be there, unlike the so, last time. So, so Bob, I just wanted to mention something. I, I understand that I, we, we all want an electric vehicle that's been a, a focus for the township, that's been um, priority for environmental advisory committee, um, but we, I, I just want to make sure we've in, investigated all options. My understanding is the Ford Maki is the only one that's CoStar's approved, but oh. I feel like it's worth because we're paying this for this with taxpayer money. Um, you know, have we exhausted all other options? I mean, there are other all wheel drive, reliable electric vehicles. So maybe Lori could speak a little bit to the work that's gone into making sure that we're getting a good uh, you know, you know, a, a car with with value, and we're we're spending taxpayer money wisely. Yeah, absolutely. It's certainly not the only. To your point, it's not the only CoStar's electric vehicle. It is the only CoStar's electric vehicle that I can get that is available, that is all-wheel drive, and is within our. Um, budgetary constraints, although this one is slightly over budget. Um, the other options that are available that are on CoStars, I think there are, there might be some Nissan, Nissan options, but are not available. I can tell you that I've spoken to every, I think every dealership that's on the CoStars list. Um, and this is the only vehicle, this is the cheapest available on lot electric vehicle that is not an offensive 
highlighter orange color. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it has been it has been a saga. Being the owner of a 2021 Maki, and I love it very much. I've also been um, reading a lot of things lately about the Maki. The prices have come down drastically, um, and I've also just discovered that the 2021 Maki is actually the best one they've made so far, and the 2023 has fewer bells and whistles than the 2021 does. Um, which I, I just learned yesterday, and I um, did some research into that. And I'd, like I said, the prices, I mean, my car is worth way less than I paid for it a year ago, but I got a great trade-in value on the car I traded in, so <laughs> I don't know yeah. how mm -hmm. that works. But anyway, um, I, I know that you, you have du dutifully <laughs> looked for this car. Um, but I've also, read that there were there was a lot of inventory so and I don't know if you're allowed to consider used cars no. either okay well that answers that but unfortunately no, the uh, the co-stars limitations uh, only go for new vehicles correct we can't buy used vehicles and then the Pennsylvania state procurement rules require that we you can only qualify you can go only be on a co-stars list for a vehicle if it's a certain percentage manufactured in the United States mm -hmm. So we're highly limited. The other issue that we've been facing is that, I mean, you pay less money on CoStars. That's the whole point. As government purchasing, we're not supposed to pay over market value. Um, so in order to qualify for those contracts, I mean, dealerships want to sell the cars for more money. So there aren't very many available that are, there might be 20 Machis sitting on a mm -hmm. Ford lot and only four of them qualify for co-stars because they have to order them off of the contract. Is it the premium or the select no. the trim? No, no, I uh, it is whatever I don't need any bell we need no well, bells no, no. and whistles. I mean, that depend if for the price it better be the premium. It's a ca it's a which is the mid California level. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, uh, Dan it's let me interrupt one second. Danielle, does that answer your question Thank that you. based on the limitations and uh, with co stars we're we, we're pulling the trigger on this one. Danielle? Oh, she might be on mute. Oh, we'll come back to that. We All right. Um, so we. Well, I'm, only, I'm only saying that because if it was a select, that's way overpriced for the no, select. No, it's so not. It's it a Cal be. California Route 1. Oh. <laughs> All right. So we have a motion, we have a second. Well, that's a great phrase, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Congratulations on hopefully ordering a new car tomorrow. Nobody drinks me. Um, discussion and possible motion to set dates for 2024 budget meetings. Yeehaw. Oh, we skipped one. Oh, I did. Oh, consider approval. No. Poor Karen. <laughs> oh, consider approval of Environmental Advisory Council EAC request to host a tree giveaway event at a cost not to exceed $2,500. And uh, I I'll think make that a, motion. And I'll second that. It's a great idea. So, Karen, I'm going to put you on the hot seat. Come on up and give us a talk. <clears throat> so, the EAC wanted to um, offer 50 native trees to township residents. Um, they're a decent sized tree. They're, they're small because it's actually studies have shown that smaller trees are actually grow faster due to um, the, the root ball not being disturbed as much and they they will grow faster than a, tr a larger tree with a disturbed root ball but um, 50 trees we're proposing to give them away on October 21st um, hopefully at the township building we plan to advertise it um, via Facebook EAC Facebook the newsletter um, and hopefully get the word out with a township uh, like a little neighborhood group email groups um, they're all native trees. They all support local wildlife, and we're hoping that we get a good turnout and that th they get planted in our township and help improve the water retention and all of that. <laughs> I'll, I'll let others get first dibs, but if there's a few that aren't spoken for, I'd love to put a couple on my property. 
That's well, I think one, thing, one per household. Well, yeah, one. <laughs> All right, I, I, so I'll take that back. I'd love to put one so on my property. <laughs> yeah, uh, but I do know some folks on uh, Spring Lane that might enjoy and getting yeah. started. This is our first yeah. attempt. Um, we are starting with 50 trees. Um, if it's successful, we would like to continue to do it to use the EAC budget because that's why we have a budget to, Great. to use it to improve the environment. <laughs> I mean, it's the honor system. I mean, uh, we would hope that if someone took the time to come to the to pick up a tree, we will give um, educational material on best practices for planting a tree and um, information about where each tree is best planted, like if it's in a sunny location or shady location. And this is a great time of year to plant yes, trees. Yes, exactly. Too. Fall is the best time. Great job, Karen. Thank okay. you. Thank and you. thank the EAC for <coughs> forward thinking on that. All right, so there is a uh, motion, a second. All in favor? <coughs> Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, then discussion and possible motion to set dates for 2024 budget. Okay. I gotta not check things off before we read them. <laughs> Problem I have. I'm so excited about checking things off. <coughs> All right, what are we looking at for the calendars, guys? So typically we plan the October workshop meeting or our budget meeting and then generally we schedule one extra um, if things go as they did last year we didn't need a second one so what we can do and what I would suggest because we just scheduled the special meeting for the Reeves property is that we get we plan budget for the October workshop and we're going to cover the fire department budget at the September workshop meeting. So we'll have already reviewed that. And we could also, as we did last year, we could cover at the October business meeting, the police budget and kind of split it up that way, rather than scheduling an additional meeting. If it becomes, I think we'll have an indication as to whether or not we're gonna need a, another meeting, but I don't anticipate that that we will. We'll hit those big, I was just saying fire those, and police yeah. are the big, mm -hmm. generally, so if that works for everybody. So you're going to do the police on the on October 11th? Subject to me talking to the chief about that, but it, that's the same okay. way we, we had done it last year. And then do the overall budget on October 26th? Yes, at the regular workshop okay. meeting. Okay. If that's okay with everybody. Yeah. But we'll also cover... Um, now, unfortunately, Martha and Susan, you'll miss this, but we can give another uh, update. But the fire we're going to review the fire department's budget at the September workshop yeah. meeting. Yeah. But we can talk. We can talk about it again. We'll go through the <clears throat> and then in November uh, at our November board meeting is when we would advertise it. Correct. And then our December board meeting we would approve it. Correct. And is that it. cutting things too tight? Mm. Nope. We're okay. okay. All right. I've got it at seven o'clock. Is that what time we're still looking at for, uh, the, workshop? for the workshop? Correct. Okay. Yep. All right. And then the next meeting. I'll make sure I have that in here. Would be November. What date do we have for the, the next meeting? The October 11th is the business meeting. Right, so we've the got the police meeting. covered there. Yep. Then and October. Then October 26th would be the overall budget. Got right. it. And we're doing that at 7? Correct, yes. And we feel that's enough that in the November 8th meeting? November 8th. November 8th, we will advertise, advertise it. prelim. Gotcha. And then adopt. It's the exact okay. same schedule that we did last year. Excellent. Make a motion, I uh, guess that we, do I need to make a motion? No, that? you don't have to All actually right. because we're not scheduling any special meetings. Good. All right, moving on. Resolution ordinances. Consider adoption of ordinance number 2023-01 authorizing ex execution of Comcast cable franchise agreement. We advertised this? Yes, we did. We missed your motion line there, sorry. Yeah. No, okay, oh. I was gonna say, I'm, I'm looking at this thinking there's discussion and I'm wondering, all right, well, I'll make a motion, we uh, move I'll on. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Two minute reports, board liaisons. Mark. All right, <laughs> Susan, anything to report? No, it's just a tree giveaway, but we covered it. Yeah. All right, Danielle, your seat's empty, but anything to report? No, no, I wasn't at the Regional Planning Commission meeting, the last meeting, and unfortunately, I'm sorry, I didn't uh, touch base with Barbara Cohen for an update. She she did attend. 
Okay, good. Martha, anything to report? The Open Space Commission nor the Historical Commission met this month, so no. All right. Oh, uh, Martha, the the tree plant, the tree um, lighting for domestic violence month. Did you did you mention that? Or do we have a date? Yes, that's on the announcements. On the announcements. It's it'll be on the. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm ahead <laughs> of myself. Excellent, uh, Township Manager. Yes, uh, just very briefly. Uh, this Friday there will be a road closure on Jug Hollow Road as we have a contractor coming in to clean out the culvert. We also had our first meeting with the architects starting our feasibility study, so we're very excited about that. Um, so we are expecting at the October workshop meeting, so directly before we get into our budget <coughs> hearing, they will make their tentatively, if all goes as planned, which I think it will, they'll make their initial report. It'll be a 15 minute presentation to the board, but I thought it would be a good time it, they'll be able to give us not numbers, but a general concept of what we might be looking at. That's when they'll be able to present our needs, basically. They'll have our needs analysis done at that point. So October 26th, they'll come before the board. But you'll start seeing over the next couple weeks the reports that they're putting together. So okay. we just had our kickoff meeting yesterday. You said October 26th in October or September? October. October. Uh, I might have said the wrong number. Day. It's our whatever our workshop is. In October. October, October correct. Okay. okay. Did I say? Yeah. Okay. So we'll have them go first. It'll be brief, and then we'll get into our budget hearing. Okay. But yeah, but we're excited about it. It was a very good first meeting. Good. Paul. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, as the uh, board is aware, uh, Dolly Construction for Paul Lehman Drive has submitted a pay application uh, number two to the township. Uh, we have asked for them to go through some punch list items, which uh, we've asked for a couple times now, and they, they're, uh, I assume they're busy with the end of the year, or I should say end of the year, end of the summer and the good warm weather to do things. So they've been kind of pushing it off to do the punch list, which will also push off us giving the pay app. So uh, we did reach out to Matt Epler with Dolly, uh, and he said he's going to try to organize something. We just asked that if they're gonna go through, they have to have representatives there and we want to open up some manholes and things like that that we haven't been able to inspect to date. So as soon as we get that through, we can finish up or finalize the punch list and then can get a pay out to Lori for- How heavy board. is the punch list? Are there major concerns in any areas? No, there, there aren't. It's, it, it's, it's minor little items. Uh, the, the biggest question is that the, uh, some of the storm structures have manhole lids and, and they've sealed them so we can't get down to go do the investigation. So until until we can go through and verify that. Again, they've said that they've gone and have cleaned up a lot of stuff, but um, we want to we want to pop the lid and go down and take a look ourselves. How much money is left in the uh, um, escrow? The escrow, I think it's probably about, I think their pay up's about 300,000. Is, is that just oh, about it, Lori? Right. I think I forget. I haven't and looked at I apologize. Finish, I haven't looked at it in a couple months because they it. submitted and we said we have to do our punch list. Yeah. I'm surprised that they're sitting on that kind of money. That's a bit bizarre. Okay. I, I, I mention that to my design team all the time. Do that. <laughs> <laughs> because all yeah. you need is some laborers on a couple of rainy days to go out there and yeah. take a look at this. But. <clears throat> all right. Thanks, Paul. Fire. Tom, have anything to report? No. <laughs> all right. Put you on first last time, but you control how long you talk now. So I, I've already <laughs> excluded the jokes about replacement vehicles with 550s. <laughs> uh, uh, 24 calls for the month. 116 members responded. 87 hours. Excuse me. 87 members in training for 234 hours. Mm. Uh, three community outreach events for a total of 153 man hours in service in the community. Uh, average manpower per response uh, eight and a half or eight and a half members with an average response time of seven and a half minutes. Uh, October 9th is our fire prevention open house. Usually a great turnout. Love to see you guys come out and support us. We can show ourselves off. What's um, the date? October 9th, October what time? 9th. Uh, October 14th yeah, is I mean, our Tennessee. lasagna sale. And November 4th uh, is the biannual breakfast. Uh, other than that, we're looking forward to showing ourselves off and presenting for the workshop later on this month and showing you what we've been up to with the consultant. So, questions? 
Thomas. How do you spell lasagna? <laughs> <laughs> I botched it through. Oh, no, there it goes. <laughs> Auto crack. <laughs> I'm ordering it tomorrow. Can he I order it tomorrow or do right I have now. to wait yeah. and take a while longer? <laughs> Consider this an order. Can, can you get us times for those events? Oh, you got them already? So if I order that on the 6th, I'm good. If I order it by the 6th or 7th, all right. I have to put a reminder on my calendar because every year I'm like, damn it, I didn't do it. Now, a, re a real Sicilian wants to know, do you use the easy bake noodles or do you boil the noodles? I'll, I mean, I'll tell you. that's... <laughs> that, that, that's a threshold question there. All right, well, a real Irishman tells you they are ass-kicking good. Uh, <laughs> and I just have to send Carolyn an invite so she gets the reminder to, to actually order them. Boom, done. All right. Uh, discussion, uh, additional business, discussion of agenda items for upcoming workshop meetings. I think we covered think that already. That, yeah. Announcements? Do we? It has those. I got a list of those here somewhere. Or do I? Announcements. On Monday, September 18th, 2023, at 7 o'clock, Home Energy Savings 101 workshop will be held at East Pikeland Township Building, 1158 Rapsdam Road, Phoenixville. This is a free workshop to learn about home energy saving options from PICO Rep. Mike Schneller. All attendees will receive a free home energy assessment. That's a big deal. Registration is required for participation. On Tuesday, October 10th, 2023, at 645, the Domestic Violence Center of Chester County will host a tree lighting ceremony, Light the Night for Hope and Healing, on the grounds of the Schuylkill Township Municipal Complex. So October 10th, 645. And I think that's it for announcements. And public comment. Anybody have anything to say that they haven't yet? All right. With uh, Pico is September 18th at 7 o'clock at the uh, Municipal Township Building on Rapsdam Road. I have to go, but they're going to tell me things I don't want to hear. Sorry again, but why do you make them wait and go last? <laughs> Two-minute reports happen at the end. Oh, okay. It's just, it's just been that way, but I also I wondered that tonight, like for, you know. But anyway, we'll come back to that and maybe talk about it down the road. All right, with that, if there's no other discussion, I motion to I just adjourn. Have, I just yep. have one very, very quick, quick, quick thing. I did talk about this with Lori, um, just an agenda item for a future uh, workshop or yeah, workshop meeting. Um, I think we need to start to talk about um, um, uh, like emergency management situations and what our public should know and things like that um, we have a railroad that has hazardous materials um, we have flooding we've had wildfires everybody talks about how their emergency management operations are a hot mess and this person's being sued in Hawaii and this other person's being sued up in New York um, I don't want that to happen here I want our public to be made really well aware of what our emergency situations are and who they need to listen to and what happens in specific situations. And I think it would be a really nice idea to have that as a future workshop meeting. I think that's a great idea, Martha. What? I think that is a great idea. idea, Martha. And you also have a big dam in your township, too. Yeah. yeah. And we had a threat yeah. a few years back. Yes. May I make a recommendation that we use that for one of your presentation nights at the country club rather than a workshop? That's a great or, idea. Uh, uh, you know what? I just wanted to throw it out there. I don't really care where we do it. I think it's something that needs to be discussed, and that's a great idea. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have no... Let's get some usage. Yeah. We're all papered up, so we're ready to go. Like, we got to go. <laughs> we're ready. All right. Cool. Yeah. Come on up. Yes. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry, Bob. Oh, sorry. You're still in leader mode. Good evening, John Morass. Uh, Martha, in case what you're talking about, I brought up the subject a while ago about the police department or someone notifying us on Meadowbrook Lane if there was an incident at the school. 
And I was told that, it was come th that would come through the Chester County uh, Police Department, or that service. So if you know, the, na the parents and all those people are notified if there's an active shooter or anything like that, but we on Motor Brook Lane was told we can't be brought into that with the school district. So what you're talking about, is it going to go through the Chester County website? Just like I got notification that they got the guy yesterday, and I got notification with Chester County. Right. So what you're talking about, is that going to be the same thing? It all have to be discussed. You know, yeah, that's I what I'm think, saying. I think, I think this, is, this is the kind of questions that, that can be brought up right. so that yeah. we all know who, who? So that's the yeah, and like that's the reverse nine one one service, right. and, yeah. and that's that's like uh, things like when the dam was potentially going to break, or like uh, talking about the the guy who escaped, or, or things like that. But yeah, that's that's stuff that we can talk about in a yeah. future session about how it's like just the the avenue where it's done. I yeah. agree, because yeah. like you said, like where does that information come right. from? Parents to you, are notified, even, yeah. but anybody in the neighborhood of the schools, what do we wait for? Right, sirens or anything like that. So I agree with you. How do we get in this township well, notification? Get, how, I mean, how do you get the information that you need to get? Right. And, and who, do, who should you listen to? I have to tell you, there was so much garbage on social media about what happened with this guy, <laughs> about what happened. With this guy well, that escaped. We, we can we can say it here and here and now. Don't listen to social media unless it's out of an official communication. <laughs> and, and yeah, I just I just think that that we need to inform our public of where to get the truth, as as opposed to listening to, you know, I don't know whoever the guy was on Betty TikTok down the, or Betty whatever. Down the street. <laughs> yeah, tick, yeah, TikTok guy. You know, so I just is. I just think that this would be a really good thing for our emergency operations people. And I'm sorry I took up so much time here. I agree, but, I but I do agree with you, Martha. Topic. Same thing. Okay. All right, I'll make a motion to close. Second. 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 All right. All right. Thank you, Danielle. Hope you feel better. I said I hope you feel better, Danielle. Thanks. I can't feel worse, so that's hopeful.